welcome to the next stop on your journey from paycheck to pension. If you're ready to take your finances to the next level, you're in the right place. It's time to take control of your future, starting now, and we're doing it live. Hi, we're the Stidhams, and our goal is to help you get self-directed. It's the tax-free income that will shape your legacy. It's wealth, time, and the freedom you deserve. What you're about to learn will enable you to make confident and strategic moves. It means gaining complete control to invest in what you want when you want. We've helped thousands of people just like you. And if they can do it, you can too. So we hope you're ready because it's about time that your money started working for you. And we're so excited that you chose us to show you how. Starting right now. Starting right now. Hello and welcome back. We <laughs> right. <laughs> it's it's been a minute. We've been traveling. We were intended to go live while we were traveling. We had a whole setup and everything. What we didn't know were some of those um, technical things or just obstacles that we still have to learn about streaming on the go. So the next one we will we will have it all ready to go. We'll know more better how to better prepare i guess well and so, we're known for technical challenges and so it would have been a, a cluster had uh we gone live and we were sitting in that hotel room so uh, uh would have been nice though yeah would have been nice man that was that was something else uh, we had a wonderful trip though just a little quick update while some people are folks are still getting in we went and helped san diego get self-directed and that was really exciting it was a lot of fun because this event was um, a little different than the ones that you're used to doing, right? Yeah. Uh, so normally, <clears throat> normally um, I'm asked to get in front of, I'll call it these masterminds. Um, there are these, you know, held in these banquet rooms, pretty private. Um, you know, you got to pay some fee to be able to enter for someone's program. And usually what I'm doing is I'm educating the people that are in that room on how to free up capital to be able to participate in whatever this group is referencing, whether it's some specific related real estate venture, maybe it's a fund, like there's many different vehicles that uh, that uh, these groups offer. But this one was actually uh, a fresh new start and an opportunity to be able to just learn. And so, right, it was a, a bit unique, even the, the, um, the venue. Was, yeah. was fairly unique compared to other venues that I'm used to speaking in or in front of. So yeah, it was pretty awesome. It, the venue was different and the demographic was different too. The These were younger people. Here's the part that I want to share about, and it really leads into why we want, the, why we're talking about this. We'll beat this drum. It's not a dead horse. This horse is not going to die. <laughs> So we can't right. beat a dead horse. Um, this, okay, the guy who threw this event, right, the host of this event, he had a pretty heavy why this was important to him. So he put, puts this whole uh, event together. His group was called um, Cherry Pick Capital. Uh, we'll probably have him here on the show as a guest. And he's a real estate investor, right? He's like, what did he say? He was 33 early 30s. Yeah. Right? Okay. So early 30s. Well, he as we're talking to him the night before at dinner, he shares his why, like why he is just hell bent on retiring early and found non-traditional ways to do it. Why real estate investing was even attractive to him in the first place. And we're going to have him on and have him share his story, but here's here's the piece to hold on to. He's kind of this is all about real estate. We're talking about real estate investing. Of course, this is Donnell's wheelhouse. And this is these are the conversations that he has and the reason why people bring him out, right? But I ask different questions because it's not my lane. My lane is digging into uh, peeling back some of the some of the layers in a different direction or from a different direction. And I asked him um, why, why this was important to him. And he tried to minimize it and downplay it like, oh, you know, I have just, um, it's just something that's really near and dear to my heart. Well, what is it if you don't mind sharing? And 
this is because I'm also kind of really nosy and I know this was absolutely none of my business to ask, but if he wasn't willing to share, I would, I'd be okay with that. Right. I'd be okay with that. But he shared that when his dad, his dad had worked his whole life and retired at whatever, 60, 65, whatever it was. Normal retirement age. Normal retirement age worked his whole life. Right. And the day before this guy's 18th birthday um, would have marked two years that his dad had been retired. Two years. He worked his whole life, was retired for two years, and the day before his 18th <clears throat> birthday, he passed away. And it was just a freak accident. But he passed away. And it gave him this concept of time that is not generally gifted to us at that age. And it was almost at that moment that he had declared that he was not going to wait until he was retirement age. He was not going to go down this, this path. And this was going to be his driver, his, his motivation for not uh, doing this and spending your life working and then finally being able to enjoy all of the things that you had worked for for two years now, this is a pretty big why. Hey, everybody. It is super exciting to see everybody back, by the way. We missed you guys. Um, this is a pretty heavy why. And I think everyone can relate to this, that we wait. We are sacrificing. We are putting in the time. We are putting in the hours. That it's all supposed to mean something. And at some point, it's because what if we can't work, right? What if we... Um, are forced to retire, then what? Then what? And you ask that question all the time. Then when, okay, your plan, wave a magic wand, all of your debts paid off, all your house is paid off, all of those things are done, then what? Right. And for him, it was, uh, well, that's the end. For a lot of people, that's what, that's what they're left with. And this, you, he didn't say this part, but you could tell in, in the tone and inflections and his body language that he was using. He was frustrated and he was angry that that happened and wasn't about to, it was, became non-negotiable. And so tonight we're going to talk about five, five ways that you can stretch your retirement, five ways that you can supercharge your retirement savings so that you can retire early so that you can retire with a sustainable retirement income because that part's important, uh, specifically because of inflation. And we have a couple of videos that we're going to share with you because they're just some things that we saw circu cir circulating and we wanted to uh, incorporate them in the messages that uh, these, these people, creators, whatever you want to call them, have had out there. Anything else you want to add before we jump in? No, I just think it, it also fits into this bucket of conversations that I've been having around um, retirement nest eggs, how much, you know, based off the age, based off what you contribute, hey, what should I contribute to be able to achieve this dollar amount? And I think it just kind of speaks to a series of the similar or same conversations that I've been having this week. And, you know, I tend to kind of uh, model these lives off of conversations that I've been having. I know it may not fit what someone's al algorithm or whatnot, but I know, but these are the conversations that I am having on a traditional basis, on a consistent basis around what should I do with my money? And, um, and again, I think these, these videos even fit into that same theme. It's, you know, based off inflation, based off my age, based off what I'm able to contribute, how long would it be? How long would it take for me to be able to hit this dollar amount? Not even realizing the odds of you hitting this dollar amount may look one way. And, you know, just kind of digging into some of those details. So, no, you, I think you're spot on and identifying what are those different ways to be able to hit that goal. Yeah, the other thing that I wanted to add in here was that there's this whole is a bar rooftop patio, right? That's where this event was held, which was a lot of fun. It was cold, but it was fun. And the majority of the people there were probably in their 30s, mid 30s, yeah. early 30s. That's like 28 to maybe I didn't really there maybe may have been one or two people over the age of 50. Yeah. There, it was it was a pretty young group, and yeah. I think what's amazing out of this is as I was looking around the room, the rooftop, I guess it's not a really a room, 
And I was, now that I know his why, I'm looking around at the amount of people and who he is impacting with his why now, right? All of these people, this is the ripple effect of the good that he's doing from something that was so tragic in their, in he and his family's life, right? Right. All I could think of at the end was how proud his dad was of him. And I hope we can get him on the show and I hope that we can kind of talk more through, through like what is powering him and the change that he wishes to make. Cause I want people to hear it from him, not just me, but it's legacy at the end of the day, even though he had two years of retirement, this sentiment is what was, was seeded into his son. And now this is where he's taking it. And so that's what I want, but hope we can share with you is that you don't have to wait. We can seed, we can take all the stories and all the whys, and we can share them amongst each other. The community that we're building, of course, if you're on Facebook, jump in our community. Uh, we've been quiet on there just because we've had a lot going on in the past couple of weeks, but it doesn't mean that other people aren't in there and, and not discussing these types of things. So I uh, hope you'll join us there. Okay. So on that note, let's jump in. Let's talk about these videos because I think that they're important and I think that they were well done. So there's no no reason for us to to recreate them. Right, right. Um, where'd they go though? Here we go. Which one do you want first? I don't. I don't really have a preference. Just okay. Jump in. Here we go. Is a hundred thousand dollars the new middle class? I hate to say it, but I think it's actually a hundred and twenty. Hear me out on this. I think a staple of the middle class is owning a home. And in order to own a home these days, you need to make about $120,000 if you carry some debt to afford a three seventy-five dollars or $400,000 house, which is the average home in America. Your net pay on 120 is gonna put about $7,800 into your pocket. But your house payment on a house like that with these interest rates is about 3,700 out the door, 300 in utilities, you're at four grand just for housing. Then you got 800 for health and car insurances. You got 1,000 for groceries, 300 to put gas in the cars, 150 on cell phones. Maybe one of you have student debt for 400. Maybe one of you still have a car payment for 500. 250 in credit cards, 100 for personal care, 100 for subscriptions. And this is if you don't have kids or have pets and you're left with about 200 bucks. But this doesn't account for, again, if you have kids, a savings account, 500 bucks a month into a Roth IRA, or putting money towards your debt to be debt free, or the big one is having fun, being able to go out you know, once a week or buy gifts or, or save up for a vacation. So this is $120,000 a year, this is wild. And just three years ago, you could achieve this same life for $70,000, it nearly doubled in just three years. And that's why we continue to talk about this because no one's ever seen this kind of a shift this quickly. Hmm. Yeah, and I couldn't agree more that, that this is where we're at. And what, what's interesting is we've talked about the 4% rule a lot and right. the safe withdrawal rate being that 4%. Now we have uh, Dave Ramsey who has uh, beat completely beaten up his, uh, I don't know what, 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 I have like a, something on my face. Um, who is this guy to him? Uh, just a staff member, someone who also creates content, um, through their brand. And he says, no way, seven or 8%, four, three, maybe five. Some people argue, oh no, it's five now, regardless of, of what, the number is that people are saying. I think what's important, context is important. Right. And everything that he had listed on there are just pretty much surviving. Nothing Get is, is, is about the future. Right. And we, you know, you, well, I, we, you did a great job of putting together that, 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 um, um, uh, workbook around identifying what's coming in and what's going out. So in just using this video, Based off what's going in and what's coming out, again, not accounting for what he's putting in his or what they may be putting into a retirement account. And he listed those other things that weren't being accounted for. We've got cash flow of two hundred dollars. Right. So based off this cash flow of two hundred dollars, but I make one hundred and twenty thousand dollars in income every year. I can afford a three hundred, whatever, four hundred thousand dollar home. But at the end of the day, my cash flow is two hundred dollars a month. How? Like, how is it possible for me to even participate in some of the things that we discuss on this channel? Like, like, what are those steps? Like, how is this even possible? So until your point, he, this video was about 
what's happening today. We focus on how do you get to your goal, whatever that future goal might be in 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 the future. Um, how is that even possible when you're bringing home when your cash flow is only two hundred dollars a month? Like, what do you do? And this is a real problem. Yeah, and a lot of people would say, "Oh, well, all you got to do is." I was watching. I don't. I don't know if you guys have seen this, but it's um, how to get rich on Netflix. There's a show. This is literally the title, which is a cool title. Well done, right? I mean, it pulled me and I wanted to see how do you get rich? And there's a a guy who is the expert and he sits with people. And so probably the first like three, four episodes, you meet probably, I don't know, like 12 or 14 different um, situations. What was so interesting was this one particular uh, girl on there and she had uh, just purchased a home and felt like she finally made it. Like this was a milestone moment for her and she was super proud. She was just trying to like keep it. The debate was on whether she should sell the home or rent. Now, I think for some people this makes sense. If the math maths, and then it just maths, but it was a $500 difference. And you're telling me she couldn't have gotten a roommate right? Or found another way because she's building, she is building equity. There is something there. But what was being said was at least with, she said, at least with renting, I won't have to worry about an HOA fee going, increasing. Like my, my payment will be the same. Right. No, it won't. Because when you're leasing. You can't control the rent. You can't control the rent. And the harder that it is for people to uh, buy homes, the the more uh, control landlords have over the, the rental market. Uh, you want me to play the next one? Sure. Okay. So on that note, here was a really, really great one. Let's get into it. Uh, what are your financial goals? Big goal, I'm trying to buy a house. <laughs> yeah, right. What? You'll never own a home. But I work 40 hours a week. That's awesome. Nobody cares. I, I don't live paycheck to paycheck. No, you're not what we call paycheck to paycheck. You're what we call vacation to pet surgery. <laughs> oh. Have you ever had to replace all four tires on your car at once? Yeah. How was that for you? Why are tires so expensive? <laughs> That's not good. Speaking of cars, seems like you paid your car off recently. Thank you. I did pay off my car. That's a big boy move. The very same month your student loans picked back up. I forgot about those. Everybody did. But I just got a raise. So did all the prices. Yeah, what's going on with eggs? Oof, eggs are having a year. That's why I stopped eating. When did you stop eating? Yesterday. What are your long-term life goals? I'm honestly just trying to be able to afford a kid. Now keep in mind, you cannot afford a child. You can't even afford yourself. But if you're gonna have a baby, have a bunch of them. Pump her up as many times as she can handle. Then get those babies online immediately. Likes and shares. I'm not really sure how it works. Eventually one of them might turn profitable. Pay off your debt and maybe even buy you that house you want. Is that a no on stocks? I wouldn't. Phew. It's pretty accurate though, right? Pretty dang accurate. <laughs> and But, but, get, but notice, consistency between both videos but what do you do right yeah Not, what do you this, do right right these are the things you can't do but what do you do yeah. and i think that's the part like there is a way out of this thing but if we if if you wait until you're debt free or you wait until the home is paid off or you wait until whatever that future activity might be then at what point do you get started and how much time have you wasted? How many compound cycles have you lost? How much money has not been made because you're waiting until whatever that point might be? But notice, no one's talking about what do you do? Yeah. And this is all about the current <laughs> conditions, right? So right. this is where we are now. It's not talking about where we're going right. or what we right. need to prepare for. Because I think right. the reason why a lot of people are in the, a lot of people, we are people too, are in the position that we are in and this middle class doesn't, it doesn't feel like you are wealthy at $120,000 a year. Remember when that was, that would have been a big deal. That would have been a big difference. Um, 
it's not anymore. And this is why eggs are having a year. Eggs sure are having a year. Bread's having a year. Uh, the amount of, of like the inflation rate versus the uh, inflation for on costs and uh, goods and services, I think is completely different. And here's why I'm going to, I'm going to prove it to you now. <laughs> Do you guys remember this? It was in the paper, this one. So a dollar off. Give yep. yourself a dollar, guys. 1983. 1983 to the day. So I broke it down. 450 for the orange juice. 450 for saran wrap. TV dinner couldn't find the exact same one, so we did five dollars for that one because it had the food on the side. 13 bucks for the tide, three bucks for the wonder bread. 350 for the frozen Mac, 460 for the milk. You got 879 for the dryer sheets. You got eight bucks for the uh, toilet paper, and you got just shy of nine bucks for the toy soldier. What does that come down to? The grand total is $63.73. Add on tax, $5.25. And put that together, you get $68.99 rounded up a penny. And that's where we are. So, okay. So here we are, 1990, it was 1983 and 1990. In 2022, that was $68.99, right? Under 70 bucks. In 1990, $19.83. In 2023, that same amount would be um, $45.62 if you're going by the inflation rate, right? So if you're calculating, if you were in 1990 and you were trying to calculate um, what would 20 bucks be worth in 2023, right? The math would say 45, 45. yeah, $45 around there. However, um, you can't buy 20, those same groceries for $20. You couldn't buy them for $45 today. And this is why it is so dangerous to not be in a position where you have options, not be in a position where you have leverage, because there are just things that we cannot control. And so everything that we're going to talk about tonight is about what we can control and how to put ourselves in a, in a better position along the way and be able to uh, get leverage faster. Right. So that's what we are, uh, what we're talking about. I know I see you guys here in the comments. This is crazy, right? What's happening? Jeff says, um, this is why finances should be required class for all high school seniors and college kids. Couldn't agree more, but even more so, I think that if we were even to go earlier, junior high, I think they, it's even more important for elementary and junior high kids to get on board because they're, they, um, it is difficult, especially around holidays like this time right now, for them to even consider that money just doesn't grow on trees, right? Right. So what they want, the pressure that they put on parents, I think that them being a part of the solution, them being aware of what is going on, they can uh, contribute towards solutions or at least understand why different decisions might need to be made. So, ah, man, I know, I know it. It's just a thing and we have to plan for it. So instead of, um, this isn't fear mongering, this isn't look what's coming, be afraid. It's be prepared, get right. educated and be prepared. And that's get the best thing that we can do. Right. Get there self direct. Take control. Understand that this is where we are and understand, you know, it may change, but it also may not change for the better. So therefore, what actions can you take to put yourself in position so that as things do change, at least at minimum, you are working towards providing a solution mm -hmm. versus yeah. letting life happen to you, letting inflation happen to you, letting the government happen to you, letting those things that you can't control happen to you. How about getting better prepared so that at least I can pivot when I need to pivot, or at least I've got this vehicle working in the background to assist in where it is we're headed. Yep. I don't know that um, any of the solutions that we're going to talk through today solves the problem, but they all assist in making the problem a lot easier to be able to deal with. So. Yes. Understanding what, it, what the problem is, is also important because yeah, who would, who would have known that 
from 1990, $20 worth of groceries would be $70 today or even just last year. And that it it really, if you're looking at inflation, you would have been prepared coming to the store with $45 going, well, this is how much it should be costing. Yep. That's a significant increase. That's a significant increase out of your out of your paycheck, out of your budget, right? So for a lot of people, especially people who are on fixed incomes, imagine what they're facing right now. When they were taught to plan for the 4% rule, they were taught to plan for the safe withdrawal rate, which would have been the number that they would have needed in order to survive and in order to stretch out their retirement funds for 30 years. But let's talk about that. Let's talk about, and let's do a little quiz. Let's talk about um, what those numbers are so that we can have a more realistic understanding of where, um, where we are as a people in terms of being prepared for this, because it doesn't matter if you're prepared or not, it's coming regardless, right? right. It's gonna happen. But who is prepared? How many people are prepared? Um, I saw you had uploaded it somewhere. Yeah, is so- it's on the Viveboard? Yeah, it's on the Viveboard. Okay, all right, you ready to jump in? Let's do it. All right, oh, let me make sure it's, let me make sure it's on here. Before I mess up. All right, here we go. Oh, come on. Doom, 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 da, da. Um, hold on. It's not, it's not working. Hold on. Here we go. Mm -hmm. Wow, I love that so much. So um, <laughs> the slide that you're looking at is one of the slides that I used during the event in San Diego. And it was just simply to ask a few questions. So I'll ask the same questions of, of this group. Because a lot of, a lot of times when I'm meeting with people and we're talking about j retirement and retirement income and what that looks like and what vehicles may work may or may not work best for you, it always evolves around what do you expect retirement to be? And and usually to a T, it, you know, if I'm talking to five people within a day, at least three of them, if not four, are going to say, "Hey, I'm looking to at least have that million dollars in retirement." And so it just so so kind of building the foundation of this discussion today is really around how many people. Do you know how many people would you expect? How many Americans would you expect to be able to retire with a million dollars or more in their retirement nest egg? Meaning it's it's a very simple number, but most people don't don't see how powerful this number is or how um, uh, major this number is. As in a million dollars is not a lot when you look at it from the grand scheme of things. I've been working 40 years and I've got a million dollars in retirement. But how many people within this country actually build up a million dollars into their retirement nest egg? How many would you would you say? What would you think? And I guess while I'm letting you think about that number, I'll also jump into the question number two because it goes along uh, the same lines. What is that median retirement nest egg size? So how many actually retire with a million dollars inside their retirement, meaning nest egg size of a million dollars? And then what do you expect or what do you think the actual median is? And these numbers are drastically different. And so from, let me make sure I'm, I didn't do this earlier. Let me do it now. One moment. So as it relates to retirement or, or how many people retire with a million dollars or more, that number is. Uh, wow. Smaller. And that'd be that big. Doesn't it? Yeah, that's a big number. It's a big two. About 2%. And it's actually less than 2%, but um, just, just in rounding cases, what that basically says is 98% of Americans retire with something less than a million dollars. And and to the second question, what is the median retirement nest egg size? And I used median for a reason. I didn't use average. And it's because when you look at just from a simple math perspective, average takes into consideration savings and a lot of ancillary things that is very, very difficult to be able to gauge when you're talking about a range from a 25 year old to a 65 year old. So I use median because it kind of really more speaks to what that size of a nest egg would actually be. So what is the median nest egg size? So if the average American Oh, I'm sorry. For a million dollar nest egg size, they, that amount is somewhere around 2% of Americans do. So that means 98% of us are not going to have a million dollars in, in, uh, within our uh, retirement. So what is that median amount? What is that uh, amount that traditionally we have when we're approaching that retirement age of 65? And that median amount 
or that median retirement size is actually somewhere around 200K. Meaning you've worked 30 years, 35 years, 40 years to achieve somewhere around $200,000 or less inside of your retirement. And again, these last few questions, you all know because we've because we cover this a lot on here. If you have a million dollars in retirement, what do you expect that income to be? We all know if you've been of the 35 people who are on this live right now, most of them are people who have followed us for a long time. You know I harp on this, Angelique harp, harps on this a lot. And that is the 4% rule, the safe withdrawal rate. If you've got a million dollar nest egg in, in, inside of your retirement, how much income would you expect that to be? Well, 4% of a million dollars is 40 grand. But as it relates to what that median retirement nest egg size is of 200,000, what does that equate to? 4% of $200,000 is eight grand a year. Who can live off eight grand a year? But the problem is we don't learn this until it's too late. We don't learn this till we're approaching retirement age. So the best thing you can do right now is regardless of what your age is, take a look at where you are sitting from a retirement perspective. Do the math on how long you've been with the company so far. If this is your forever company and you plan on retiring with that company, it's pretty easy to determine mathematically what you can anticipate your nest egg to be by the time you, by the time you retire. If it's anywhere close to a million, that's awesome. But just realize that million dollars inside your company's retirement account equates to $40,000 a year in income. So that's, and then as it relates to what is the 4% rule, the 4% rule is a study that was done back in the late 90s to determine how much you should safely withdraw out of your retirement when it's time for you to withdraw, uh, take that uh, retirement withdrawal. And it's based off this thing called the Trinity study. And what we've learned is it that that dollar amount as of today is around four percent. But what we know, based off inflation, based off the fact that very few uh, Americans are retiring with enough in their retirement account, we know that dollar amount is transitioning to more like three and a half percent, if not three percent. But if you find a, the right guru, they will tell you that five percent is sufficient. And the truth is, it doesn't really matter what the percentage is because it's really about not running out of money. And so, if you're taking five percent, if you're taking ten percent out of your retirement, but it does only last you eight years, then you're going back to work. So if you're taking that 4%, if the safe withdrawal rate is 4% and you still end up running out of money, none of that matters because you're going back to work. And so the, the thought process is then what do you do? What are some of the actions that you take? How do you correct this issue? And that's kind of what we want to want to, want to deal uh, dig into. And last thing I wanted to highlight, I think it's over here. So what we wanted to talk through also, and this has been a consistent theme that we've discussed or that I've been discussing over these last several weeks. I think it's been a week since we've been live and this conversation probably started two or three weeks ago. It's based off my age. What does it take for me to actually achieve that million dollar nest egg? Again, knowing that only 2% of Americans actually get there. What is that dollar amount that I need to put away over time to be able to achieve that million dollar nest egg? And there's two ways of looking at this. There's a traditional retirement planning way. There's a secure compound interest planning way. There's a there's a there's real estate. There's all of these different vehicles that we can dig into as to how do we achieve that million dollars. And so what I just wanted to highlight here is um, if you were thinking about a secure compound interest account. And as I communicate, it's all about pay yourself first. It's all about getting started now, because what you want to do is get out in front of those compound cycles, get out in front of the fact that, hey, if I can start right now, that gives me more time, more compound cycles for my money to be able to work for me and to be able to produce income. So what does it take at ages 25, 35, 45, 55 to be able to achieve a million dollar nest egg? And what that should allow you to do is based off those values, Put yourself in position as to where you are today. Do you need to increase what it is you're contributing regardless of what the vehicle is? Or do you need to decrease or meaning are you in a, a solid position to be able to achieve that goal? And then the last piece I want to make sure we address tonight is we're talking non-inflation adjusted numbers. When someone's talking about a million dollar nest egg, nine times out of 10, they're basing that off of what a million dollars is today. What right. does that you're 25? And you're not you won't you're not hitting retirement age for 40 years. 
And you're focused on trying to achieve a million dollar nest egg at age 65. At age 65, that million dollars isn't a million dollars anymore. So it's understanding what that impact will be uh, based off what that true retirement age is and how that looks in the future. And even if what you would need to contribute isn't a realistic number, at least you understand these are the actions that it takes. So I would much rather be focused on trying to hit that $4 million nest egg, which equates to a million dollars in the future. And I'm making up a number. I don't know that that's what the case is. But my point is, I'd rather focus on what that number is and not hit it versus under un, underperform by focusing on a million dollars and, and coming way too short, which means there's not an opportunity for me to retire. So the key is just understanding what those values are. And we can either jump into them now um, or uh, we, if there's any questions, we can kind of highlight those questions if you want. But if we want to understand what it would look like inside of a secure compound interest account for these four age groups, uh, we would just have to jump into the calculator. So what would you like to do, sweetheart? Um, I'd like to hit the button and have it work. That's step one. I, I, I would like to go over some of these before we talk about the dollar figures, yeah, because fair. I think for some Let's people it. it's already jarring. Like Nathan was like, um, he said only 200 K the reality of that number for retirement is depressing. Right. But that's the reality that a lot of, that most people are facing. And because of the video that we played, all of those are the factors of why some people only are only able to do 200,000. Here's the other reason, because that could have been 400,000 and the market dropped. That could have been 500,000 and they have it in a casino because of their job or they thought they were doing the right thing and now it's just worthless. It could have been that they thought they had the time to recover from a down market, but then they actually didn't because they were forced to retire based on their health, based on being laid off from their job. There's a lot of, of factors to, con to, to consider here. And so here's, here's one of my, um, the one thing that I wanted to, to bring up, it's, to first determine what's non-negotiable. Um, there are a lot of factors that we cannot control, but the one thing that we can control is what is and what is not negotiable for us. If we don't decide that today, if we don't have a list of what are those things that are non-negotiable for us, then we are saying that everything is negotiable. That's it. There's no other way to really get around that, right? So that's where I think it's really difficult, especially if you have decision fatigue, to put this on a list because you have to say that you are worth it to put to write this down and say this is non-negotiable. This means that this will now govern the decisions that you're making too, right? So if you say that this is non-negotiable, then all the decisions and the choices, your behavior along the way has to prove that right. But in saying that it's non-negotiable, your mind will start to believe it's non-negotiable, right? right? First, you have to make that decision. And so I want to know, how, is there anything in your life in regards to your finances that are just simply non-negotiable? We have um, met with a lot of people and some of those calls have the couples putting down what it is that they, that they spend in a, in a month. She spends this and I spend that, right? So it could be- These are her finances. These are my finances. They don't talk. Yeah. One guy was even like, no, don't even involve her. I don't want to even talk to her about this. So it's just me and you. Don't consider her factors or anything like that, right? He was just like, this topic is the boogeyman in our home. Don't want to do it. Not going to do it. Not a vibe. So he that was non-negotiable for him until- he started to look forward. Then he started to see that because he made that non-negotiable, all of his decisions were leading towards never fixing that problem. Therefore, the boogeyman was just going to get bigger and bigger years down the road. That's a gift to be able to hand to people, by the way. I really appreciate that you get to do that on a daily basis. Even though it's like a come to Jesus moment, sometimes it's really uncomfortable that people can have those moments with you and come to those realizations to say, okay, now can you help me? Like hold my hand on L if you need to. I am terrified to take this step and it's uncomfortable for me, but I feel better being able to do it with you. 
Yeah, I mean, and from your because I think you said it perfectly. And the non-negotiable perspective is: will it make the boat go faster? The non-negotiable perspective is: pay yourself first. Like it, it, these, it, the non-negotiable perspective is. Um, get self-directed. Like I think all of these speak, all of these are in line with the same thing. If, 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 if nothing else, it's understanding what direction are you going? What's the goal? And are we both on the same page to get there? The only way you can accomplish this is if that, if that's the case. And even for, for, for the, from that example that you had mentioned related to the husband and wife who have, have decent income, yeah. but their in- incomes are not focused on the same things, not headed towards the same goal, but they are in the same boat but they're both rowing in opposite directions, which means they're not going anywhere. Right. Um, April says, what do you mean by non-negotiable? Please explain. April, non-negotiable means that this is like mandatory. It is, how about this? Toilet paper, non-negotiable, right? (laughs) What else? What else is... But you know why you know why I say this? It's not I'm not trying to even be funny. It's because sometimes what when we start to make these claims of what's non-negotiable for us in terms of making uh, better financial decisions, we have to relate it to something that is such a no-brainer that we then it kind of reduces the emotional impact and experience for us. So if we say something like, "Is toilet paper negotiable?" No, it's not. But am, what am I doing in my life where I'm saying essentially something as important as toilet paper is becoming, non-nego- is becoming negotiable based on my decisions, right? That's really what it is. I don't know if that, I don't know if that clarified anything, but you want to so, give, so, give it a go, Donnell? So I talk a lot about pay yourself first. And usually people understand the concept of paying yourself first. But is it truly a non-negotiable to, you know what, before the mortgage is due, before the cell phone bill is paid, before I pay Netflix, whether Hulu gets shut off or not, I am going to take a portion of my income and put it in a vehicle that's working for me. Is it a non-negotiable that this happens or not? Like, regard, it's Christmas. The holidays are coming. Is it, you know what, normally during Christmas, I go in debt. I don't go in debt intentionally. I just happen to go in debt because it's a it's a negotiable option for me to not pay myself, not get my vehicle in play, not to get this, this machine running. I'm going to go. Uh, sorry, Donnell. I know this is the, I know it's not what you wanted to hear, but um, normally during the holidays, I go in debt because I have to make sure people are taken care of. Right. After I, I have to buy these gifts. And, and my response is traditionally. No, you don't. You're making this a negotiable option option. But in truth, if your focus was pay yourself first, starting today, somewhere secure, compound your money, and then get that compounded money leverage so that I can build wealth. If it was a non-negotiable that that equation matter, then you know what? You It would be easier to have that conversation around, you know what? What I'm going to do for us, us as a family, is I'm not going to put ourselves in debt over this next two week period so that we can focus on what the true goal is. Why? Because we're all in the same boat together. We're all rowing in the same direction. And this non-negotiable of going into debt over the holidays is not going to happen. Does that help? Yeah. Okay. I wanted to bring this up. I know you did. I just figured I'd rip the bandaid off. How do we bring this up and have this conversation without seeming like we're Grinches? That's what. Bah humbug. Yeah. You said bah humbug. I I heard Grinch. Mm -hmm. But but you're so right because this is a hard decision to make. It's hard. Super hard decision to make. Yeah. Because we've been conditioned. Kelvin's even like, yeah, my wife would fight me on that one. And I hear her. Right. I hear her because there have been years where I'm like, no, this is Christmas. This is where rules don't apply. This is something completely different. And psychologically, when I started to peel that back through my personal growth journey, I realized what we actually use Christmas for. And I was shook. I was floored. It was defeating, depleting. I felt void telling myself I couldn't have that anymore because it was really more for me than it was for them. And did any of us benefit from the stuff and the things and all those extra little fillers just because we like to see, we want to see this is what success looks like, right? This is what um, 
the middle class looks like. They're supposed to have trees and stuff, stockings, and you can't just put random stuff in there that's got to be stuff that they'd actually want or you're just wasting your money, right? But what we end up doing, and some lady in our group said, just what you said, she said, every year I get myself out of debt, I work hard to get myself out of debt, and then Christmas comes and I'm right back in debt. And she feels very obligated to do this because for a lot of people, there's a guilt there too. Like, no way I'm not buying my mom or my this amount of people gifts, they'll probably be buying me gifts too. Last year when we opted out, that was our first year of opting out and our kids were on board. So it wasn't us like ruining Christmas. Our kids were completely on board because they felt like it was performative. And the amount of growth that has to take place in order for our teens and young adult children to come to that conclusion on their own even, it's on their own. To say, we don't want to perform gratitude either. Not only do we not want to just buy people stuff for the sake of buying people stuff, we also don't want to perform the gratitude piece when somebody buys us something that we really don't need or we really don't want. It's thoughtful, we're grateful, but we also know like they probably could have done better if they would have just kept their money. That's growth. And I wish that for more families. I'm not saying don't buy gifts. I'm saying maybe we just need to reassess this on a national level so that we can heal, so that we can be put in a different position. Anyway, you said we weren't going to talk about it because we well, were just going to run everyone's but the Christmas. Qu the question was around non-negotiable. I am not saying I got I got the little ones who are expecting Santa to do what no Santa normally does. I am not saying don't allow that to happen. What I am saying is... Is it negotiable to allow your finance for allow you to go in debt to be able to make that happen? Right. Or is it, you know what, we're going to do Christmas and everyone's going, you know, we're going to provide what we can provide. But what we're not what what is non-negotiable is that we somehow go into debt to make that happen. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. Well, for the majority of people, though. They would have to because unless they're using their available cash flow, which for most people, regardless, you know, you, you told me the majority of people, regardless of how much they make up to $200,000 a year, that the majority of people all have how much? $500 a month, $500 to $1,000 a month in cash flow. Yeah. Because our lifestyles end up increasing to match our income. So it's not... I got a raise and now I'm going to maintain my lifestyle and take that raise and pay myself first and get it into a vehicle that's working for me. It's, ooh, I got a raise. That means my lifestyle needs to match my raise. Ooh, now I need a bigger home. And because I need a bigger home, I need more, I need bigger stuff and things in that home to be able to fill that home. And it just continues to continue to increase, which means you end up staying in the same position that you are. And that is paycheck to paycheck or $500 a month in cash flow or whatever that, 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 that issue is. And it is not that there's something wrong with you if, if these things fit you, okay? Thank you, Ida. Got a co-signer. Like, uh, no, please, it needs to be talked about, right? So um, it's, so determine what's non-negotiable. What is it that you can cut back on now? Where are the, what decisions can you change or do differently now that will make an impact because if you don't you are going to have to do them later so do me a favor sweetheart just for i think for the after video purposes number one was what we just covered it what was number one number one is determine what's non-negotiable okay we've done that yeah now we're on to number two okay. number two is um number two is Assess the trends in your industry. So we're talking about income. We're talking about security. For everyone right now, this is your current job. This is your current income stream, right? And so if we are going to um, be able to move forward with this lifestyle, with this same sense of security, then we have to be able to assess where's that income going to come from. Right. If you don't have, so Rose, you were asking, um, is there a best fit strategy for growth when you're age 60, retired, not in great health, can't qualify maybe for, which you don't know that actually, um, for a, uh, a skia, which we are big fans of, 
and the cash flow is coming from the pension only. Well, congrats on having a pension because those are like golden golden eggs at this point, golden geese. Uh, they just don't exist anymore. They're very hard to find. Um, it's to assess what your opportunities are because just because you have a job, just because you don't have a pension, just because you have maybe a high earning income right now doesn't mean that next year, uh, what it, whatever it is that you do in your department won't be uh, replaced by some sort of automated system, right? Right, right. Won't be reduced based off of what the decisions that the company has to make. And so being able to assess, so I have, uh, can you consult part-time? Whatever it is that you do, is there an opportunity for you to re uh, consult part-time at the point of retirement. So if you stay in the industry that you're in, can you transition into being a consultant within that field? If not, let's talk about maybe changing into something that you can uh, pivot or leverage that industry, the leads, the network that you've built, all of those things should be, you should be able to take with you. If not, then side income, a, not a side hustle, but side income. This could mean that you start a business, uh, which does definitely is giving side hustle. But for some people, starting a business is not a side hustle. Starting a business is side income, right? right. There is a difference. And for other people, it may be uh, grabbing a part-time job somewhere, meaning uh, you already have in line maybe something it is that you would be able to do that might not require as much effort. So if it's a uh, online or work from home type of thing that you can do even just on the weekends or a few hours a week that would get you in the habit of being able to have at least an extra $500 a month or $1,000 a month that would make a big difference when you can put it into a machine, right? You know, what's interesting is I used to, I never thought about this before. It just kind of dawned on me while we were having this discussion. That is, I used to work for Ford Motor Company. And as a young guy, I was, that was my first job fresh out of college. So uh, automation engineer for Ford Motor Company, working in plants, building robots, replacing people with robots, you know, pissing off UAW, all that kind of fun stuff. Yeah. And what um, used to confuse me is people would retire. Been with Ford Motor Company 40 plus years. They retire. And then two weeks later, I see them back in the plant. I never really fully understood that. If you're retiring, and this is when pensions were still available. So you've just retired. You have your pension. Why are you back in here? Well, they're back in there as contractors. And they are supporting the same jobs and the same positions and the same departments and the same people that they just left. Why? Because that's that supplemental income to go with the fact that their pension is based off the 4% rule. They just left a six-figure job. They're now getting 4% of their nest egg to be able to live off, which isn't sufficient. And they're fairly young. They just retired. so And they still have the mental wherewithal to continue to do their job. So Ford Motor Company brings them back. They don't have to pay them benefits. So they're getting them at a cheaper cost to Ford Motor Company. But it allows for the people who are actually doing it to come back as contractors and make a consistent wage to supplement their income. And it, and it's so to, so to your point, it's not necessarily a side hustle. It's more of a, a side income opportunity. And, and you know what? Oh, go, go ahead. ahead. No, no, go ahead. There are a lot of people who are doing that in a different way today. So what that looks like in 2023 is called a fractional CFO, a fractional CMO. So whatever your job is, if you, especially if you're in a C-suite or if maybe there isn't an opportunity, but you know you can handle that kind of job, but you won't be able to, um, you're not getting that promotion or there's not an opportunity for you to move upward with, within the, uh, the position. Uh, environment that you're in, then you can go to other companies and there are a ton of websites out there. If you just Google up fractional, your title, right? Fractional, um, I, I, the thing that's coming to mind right now is like CMO, CFO. These are very popular. And so if instead of them getting paid one salary from one company and spending their 40 hours a week there or more, right? Let's be honest with this one company who can't pay them what they're worth, now they are a fractional CFO for two or three companies and they're getting way more than what they were getting paid with the one job. So they could even contract, so they're contractors essentially, but they're on retainer 
for all of these different companies, right. and they're more so consulting on some of them, but they realize that they they don't have to engulf themselves in the same way in these teams that they had to before, because now they can show up, do their job, and then move on to the next one. Right. It's project-based, the stress is reduced, the responsibilities right. are reduced, but the income is powerful because they can actually make more money as an hourly wage because the companies aren't having to pay benefits. So it translates into more income. That's right. And the company wins too, because they don't have to pay a full salary. So That's you it. see the win-win here. And this is becoming more and more popular. And I believe this will be a uh, not just like something that's in the in the streets, right? Being talked about. This will be something that'll be just common. This will be. Uh, I was a fractional CMO, CFO, CMO. This will be on your resume, and people will be looking for that because they'll know that you'll be able to handle that. But here's what pisses me off about that. So now re the new retirement is to retire into your next fractional job. Yeah. Right. It's so it's not actual be. retirement. Yeah, it's going to have to be, though, because the majority of people don't even have a, a million dollars and you just showed them that a million dollars is not going to be enough. Right. And so along those same lines, as it relates to the video that we shared as well, and it's it's, you know, what do you do different? What adjustment can be made? And so notice in that video, they talked about the one that referenced uh, the two hundred dollars in cash flow, meaning, um, you know, once we buy this home, once we pay that mortgage, once we pay all these bills out of the seventy eight hundred dollars that I have in, uh, per month out of the one hundred twenty thousand dollar a month a year salary, that's seventy eight hundred dollars a month. I have seventy six hundred dollars left over two hundred dollars in cash flow. What do people do to end up being able to qualify for that home? They immediately go to that retirement account and do what? Borrow against it, leverage against, pillage their retirement, uh, their company's retirement account to be able to qualify that home. I think this is one where you just have to think about this a little bit different. What if instead of pillaging the retirement to be able to pay for the home, it was I'm going to reduce my contributions into my company's retirement account because I realize that the 4% rule doesn't do me any favors. And I reduce that contribution to be able to recapture that cash flow to do what with it. Now take that cash flow and maybe put it into some type of secure compound interest account that can uh, allow my income or my retirement to grow faster, more efficient, more secure, uh, less impacted by who's president, what's inflation, what did Elon Musk do or the 4% rule. Um, so so maybe it's that as well as taking a look at where is my money currently going and is there a way to adjust what it is I'm currently contributing to some of these other vehicles that I've been conditioned to believe that's where my money is supposed to go. But in truth, there are other opportunities out here to help grow my money faster. Yeah. And so what you're saying is, uh, so what would those things look like though? Let's call them out specifically. You're saying uh, maybe you don't, you're not contributing as much meeting the match. Right. Meaning you contribute up to the match. Because I have a lot of clients who, because uh, their traditional company's retirement account is their only means of retirement, they are putting in as much as possible. So they're putting far beyond. I've got I've got clients who are putting 14, 15 percent into the company's retirement account, but their company only matches up to three. Mm, right. It's significant. And when you do the math around, OK, you can do that. But what does this look like? Again, based off inflation, based off the four percent rule, based off whatever, by the age of 65, what does that translate to as it relates to income? And when you learn that's not enough for me to live off, then what what can you do different? Well, it's backing down that contribution down to whatever the because, again, take the money that the company is going to give you. I'm not saying don't contribute to your company's retirement account, but I am saying is there not is are there other vehicles out there that can help grow your money faster? Yeah. So that's a bonus tip. Actually, we're going to slip that in, rearrange it. Tip number three is to reallocate your funds and make in make reallocate your funds so that they have more impact. That's it. Okay. So that leads me to what, what my next point was, because if your money is tied up in the stock market, is tied up in a traditional uh, account like 401k with your employer, you can't move that, you are penalized for touching it. Even though you got the benefit of deferring taxes on that money, imagine if... And those who have just joined us, we played the home alone, you know, what uh, Kevin McAllister spent at the grocery store. Everybody's seen it. It's on ABC uh, News or whatever. There's been tons of articles written about it. 
However, the one thing that people aren't talking about is that $19, $20 that he spent at the grocery store is worth $45 today. That's what is the equivalent of that, 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 those funds. However, it was almost $70 in groceries that he purchased if you, he were to buy them today. So that's the difference in trying to be prepared. On that note though, if you had $20 in your account and suddenly, even though it's, it should be worth 45, it could go down and drop and be $5. It could be $1. It could be $10 because of the value of the stock market. And that's the scariest part is that not only are you going to owe taxes later, if you have the time to recover, then at some point you could experience a drop like that. And so what do we do when we are experiencing those things? Now, is this going to happen? Probably. Could this happen tomorrow? Sure. What do we do about it? Because these are things that we just absolutely can't control but we can hack them, we can leverage them if we have the right perspective and if we're educated on how to leverage them. So my tip is to leverage these opportunities. If, if this fits your profile, if you have money in the 401k and you are looking for how, I understand I should be in a Roth environment, I understand that the taxes that I'm gonna pay later are gonna be far more much more significant impact to me. What can I do in that? A lot of people say, well, just start converting it over into Roth slowly. But if you are waiting for, if you're doing this at the height of the market, then you're paying full taxes to convert this stuff over. If you wait until there's a drop, then convert at the bottom and convert it slowly, then you're paying less on those dollars and you're still converting them over and then you still get the growth from there. So that is just a hack. Put that, note that down. Um, that should be one non-negotiable tip to share with your friends. That's a cocktail tip, party uh, tip. Put it in your pocket and share it with your friends because I think that while everyone else is screaming there's a down market, we should be waiting for them so that we can go and leverage those down markets if we have the time. If you don't, though, there could be other strategies, and that's why it's not one size fits all. You say that all the time. Well, and not only that, um, the ideal situation would mm -hmm. be for your company's retirement plan to offer a Roth option. That's ideal. But there's a lot of cases where your company's 401k does not offer a Roth option. So even though this is an opportunity within the down market to convert some of your company's retirement account over to Roth, the question is, is does that option even exist? But let's 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 uh, kind of lay on the, uh, the 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 possibility of yes. Yes, you have the ability to convert your traditional dollars to Roth. And what based on what my wife just said, what she is spot on about is we should all be trying to live in a Roth environment, which means the sooner you can get that, those traditional dollars converted over to Roth, you're now building Roth profit, which means at a minimum, yeah, maybe you're still impacted by the 4% rule in the future, but you're not also impacted by taxes. So you're impacted by the 4% rule, meaning the majority of what you can take in income based off 4% of what that total nest egg is, but you're not also having to take out taxes as a result of that. And as we know in the future, do we expect taxes to be higher or lower? Again, yeah, common sense says our taxes is going to be higher in the future. Yep. So how do you take that nest egg and regardless of what the size is, how do you take that nest egg and start converting it over time into Roth? And my business partner and I came up with a concept of uh, called Rothesizing. Again, completely made up word. It's not something that you can Google even find the definition to. But what does that mean? Mm -hmm. To Rothesize? <laughs> uh uh. Was that you know uh uh for me? Because every time you say it, I think of Jazzercise because that's how old I am. Anybody else remember Jazzercise? Rothesize. But Roth and so the concept of Rothesizing is this. Again, using uh, just uh, let's say you've got that million dollars that you're looking to convert to Roth. But you are, um, uh, I guess, a million is too high. Let's call it a hundred thousand. You got a hundred thousand dollars in traditional dollars that you're looking to convert to Roth, and you're fifty years old, knowing that you can't touch your money until you're sixty years old, fifty nine and a half, basically sixty years old. Well, if I've got a hundred thousand dollars in traditional uh, that I want to convert to Roth over time, then the impact of converting a hundred thousand dollars today means I have to be, uh, I have to pay that tax liability on a hundred thousand dollars right now. That's significant. But what if 
over that 10 year period, I converted $10,000 a year, which means this year I take a $10,000 hit. Next year, I take a $10,000 hit. So I'm adding $10,000 to my taxable income and I'm spreading that $100,000 over the next 10 year period, which means by the time I am that I am 59, I would have converted all of those traditional dollars over to Roth. And that $10,000 I converted initially when I was 50 years old, I can also get compounding, uh, you know, again, if, whether this is a, uh, your own self-directed retirement account or a company's retirement account, regardless, you can, as that $10,000 is converted, it's actually working for you now, starting in that moment. And so it's building Roth profit throughout that 10 year period. And so again, by the age of, of 60, when you're able to access those funds, you would have converted that $400,000 to Roth, not taking the full brunt of the impact of what that uh, that that um, that um, tax implication might be, and maybe there's one, two, three down markets within that ten year period. So to um, Angelique's point, and that is, um, if you're within a down market, maybe they put you in a position to convert more than just that ten thousand dollars, which right. means it allows you to pay off or not pay off. It allows you to convert that hundred thousand dollars faster because you're able to take more of a tax liability in those down market years because you have less that you're having to convert. So again, this is just an, again, it's not one size fits all, but it's just a thought process or a strategy that's available to you that most don't realize even exists. Most have no clue as to how you convert traditional dollars over to Roth. And in truth, that process starts with a simple decision. It's you deciding. There's not some paperwork that needs to be filled out. It's you deciding that, you know what, as of today, I'm going to make this dollar Roth. And once you decide, it is. And now you have to work with your financial institutions to be able to transition those dollars. But the bottom line is it starts with the decision. So to answer Rose's question, because she's asking, um, you're saying doing it during a down market, if you had a hun that hundred thousand dollars that you were just talking about, Donnell, if it had dropped to fifty, then you're saying ten thousand dollars a year could look like five, right? Or it could look like instead of ten years at ten thousand dollars a year, you're doing five years at ten thousand dollars a yep. year, and you've yep. got it all converted by then. But do you see the value in doing it that way? And here's what the argument would be in a down market. What that says is the stock that I bought, the mutual fund that I bought was worth a hundred thousand. It's only worth 50,000 today. I'm not touching my money during a down market because I want my money to recover. I'm actually losing money if I do so. Again, these are schools of thought. What I'm saying is I'm, I'm not saying this is the best option. I'm saying this is it an option. And so there's an argument to be made. Why would I, um, a lot because, because I've taken a $50,000 hit, why would I go even further? Well, the reason you would do that is because when that market recovers, let's say you, because you went from a hundred thousand down to 50, you're able to convert 20,000 this year instead of 10. Right. Well, in doing so, when the market does recover, guess what happens now? Now you've got $20,000 that's available to work for you in a Roth fashion, which means you're actually in a position to make more money and recover faster because you're now building tax-free profit. So what was $100,000 and you went into paying taxes on that, you've got now $20,000 working for you in a Roth fashion, which means it's building tax-free profit going forward. Again, I'm not saying it's ideal to take a $50,000 hit. I'm just saying these are options available to you to be able to make adjustments or do something different to put yourself in a position so that you can beat whatever inflation looks like in the future or whatever these uh, uh, this, this lack of performance inside of your traditional retirement account would be. Yeah. And Hopefully that makes sense. And it's this is arming you with strategies that are possible. And these are things that traditional retirement planners won't, you won't hear from or financial advisors you won't hear from. Why? Because it impacts them when you, when you make decisions like this. That's, you know, that's always sad to think of um, advice based off of what, how somebody's impacted. Uh, Lolo says, hi, Lolo. She says, is that the same as a backdoor Roth? Back so Roth. backdoor Roth, what that's saying is let, I've got this Roth account. And I want access to some of that money in my Roth account prior to my retirement age. So how am I able to get money out of a Roth IRA and not be impacted by taxes or penalty? Well, Roth IRA says this, there's a certain amount of, my, certain amount of money that I've already paid taxes on inside this account. And because I've already paid taxes on that money inside of this account, it's now growing tax-free inside of that Roth IRA. 
Well, again, if I want access to some of that money prior to retirement age and I don't want to be impacted by taxes and or penalty, I have the ability to withdraw or take back my basis, meaning the dollar amounts that I've already paid taxes on, I'm able to take that money out. Again, that's the backdoor ATM option. They they actually call it a backdoor ATM versus a backdoor Roth. But anyway, but what that does is it allows you to withdraw funds out of your IRA, as long as it's up to the basis, you can take that money out and use it for whatever you want and not be taxed or penalized on it because you've already been taxed. So it's you you just actually having access to your own money to be able to use for whatever you want. It reduces the total amount within that Roth IRA, but you're not penalized or taxed on that dollar amount because all you're doing is taking out the basis or up to the basis. All right. So I think that I lost track. So the next tip was to the last tip was to convert your funds over slowly over into Roth to leverage down markets and t- be able to take advantage of them if you're in the position where you cannot do so now is to understand well it's n- the the world has not come to an end there's still a way to to strategize and that way you will feel different in the decisions that you're making a lot of this a lot of this getting educated um, is to make confident and educated decisions. And I think that's the power right there is because anytime that uh, conditions change, knowing that you have options and knowing that there's a silver lining somewhere and you now know, all I got to do is go find it versus somebody who's going, the world is coming to an end. I am completely stressed out and I'm never going to reach my goal because of things that I can't control. Being educated changes a lot of that and it changes how we feel about things. Therefore, it changes our entire experience and the decisions that we make. So that was that tip. I have one more. Do you want to add anything? No. Go ahead. I think you said it well. Okay. I have one more. And then I I did get your question. So it's perfect for Donnell when he's moving into his, um, it's mindset. And I, that it just all leads to mindset because if we are, if we are looking for a way to make this work because we believe that it's possible, it's going to work. If we feel like, gosh, only 2% of people, right. Do you still have that up Donnell? I can't. Yeah, put it back up. Go for it. Okay. If we believe that only 2% of people actually achieve a million dollars, knowing that what we're talking about, you need way more than a million dollars in order to have a, a, a comfortable or a secure retirement, because we haven't talked about healthcare. We're not going to in this stream, but we haven't even brushed on that so- topic. But we just all things considered, knowing that only 2%, it makes a lot of people feel like, why even try? Why even try? Why? Who's going to notice if I don't? Because clearly I'm amongst 98% of others who are going to be struggling too. So where do we camp at, right? That's right. pretty much what it is. Uh, if the median nest egg is $200,000 and I've got anything over that, then I must be doing pretty good. Still not enough. I don't know what else to say. We need some... It's not really that funny, but it's true. It's just it's just facts. And so that's why mindset is so important. We share the concept of the boat. We share the uh, we use the frame, the phrase, will it make the boat go faster? Because it's about your mindset. We um, share this all the time in regards to the story. And I'm not going to play the video this time. But the story is about a British rowing team. They hadn't won the Olympics before ever. They sucked. Everybody knew they sucked. They kept saying that they sucked. They were part of the 98%, right? That never made it. They didn't even have, or maybe, maybe they did. If you were to use this as an analogy, they were one of the teams that had 200K. Like they fit this uh, second point here, but it didn't matter because it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough to win the gold. Now, do you need a gold medal in order to feel like you've made it in life? No, we're not talking about a gold medal. This isn't like some pinnacle standard of retirement. This is like having enough to make sure that you have the things that you need, the the care and access to care that you are going to need. That's what this means. And this is not a gold medal that we're talking about here. This isn't even a silver medal. This is like a participation ribbon, right? 
A million dollars is not is barely a participation ribbon when you consider what forty thousand dollars a year is in income. When we just played you that one hundred and twenty thousand dollars a year is now middle new middle class new the new middle class right okay so they decided they decided that they were this was going to become a non-negotiable they are winning they are doing everything possible they are looking for all opportunities to be able to improve so that they can hit this goal does this mean that you're going to get this right all the time no it's like a muscle you have to exercise it right small decisions lead to big decisions lead to bigger even bigger results I'm not saying that if you mess up, anybody's going to judge you. You're the only one to judge you. What I am saying is by the time you get there, you can't go back and start making different decisions. You can't unsee this now. You're here with us and we're all doing it together. Everybody, everybody in the comments doing it with you. So you're not alone in making these decisions. Bring some people with you. Bring them on to, to watch these streams with you and join our community because we have to get this message out. By the time most people come to realize that they not only are part of the 98%, but they probably don't even have this 200,000 by the time they retire will be a new 500,000, right? And it still is not barely anything to be able to provide the care and uh, assurances that we need, let alone to retire early. We're still not on the concept of retiring early. And so on that note, I just want to sum it up by saying mindset. The first thing before you can even jump into any strategies is to get your mindset right, to believe that this is possible for you. Because if you don't, if you do, if you believe it's possible, your brain will look for reasons why that's true. Look for opportunities. It'll be able to see opportunities. If you don't, however, if you don't, it's going to prove, it's going to want to prove you right there too. It's, it's going to look for all the proof as to why this won't work, all the proof as to why you can't do it. And I believe in you. And if you weren't, if you're here and you're watching this, it means you believe in you too. Somewhere in there, you believe it's true. We believe it too. Stop pointing at people. Why do I keep doing that? You guys know I'm not being rude. <laughs> I'm, I'm being effective. I'll use my whole hand to point. Yeah, you well, that, make, you. that makes a difference. You, you believe in you. And I believe in you. <laughs> the end. Okay, you move on to your point because I know this is just going to get awkward. I'm trying to stop. Pointing. But, but but go back go back to the the slide real quick because because um, I think you highlighted something. I just want to connect two dots. Okay. One that last question. So how do we beat the 4% rule? Because there's many options that are available. We don't talk about all of them. And I just wanted to highlight a couple of things. Uh, the first one being an annuity. If I can spell it right. Um, meaning how do you beat the 4% rule? I'm getting 4% out of my company's retirement account, is there a way to beat it? There are some annuities out there that, you know, again, as we dig into this new year, you're going to hear me talk more and more about some of the different vehicles that maybe I am not personally doing, but as I am, because I'm in this industry and it's my job to produce retirement income for my clients, there are some annuities out there that are doing some amazing things. And I'd say of the thousands, there's three or four that if you do it right, they can actually outperform, outproduce the 4% rule, meaning you can move your qualified money into a properly designed index based 0% floor having annuity that will allow you to be able to beat the 4% rule. There's real estate. And that's where this um, event that we had, had spent time at um, in San Diego with this group of 25 to I'll call it 45 year olds around how you can leverage your retirement dollars properly structure them to be able to put your money in a position to where that 2% is you or that $200,000 in uh, retirement nest egg doesn't apply to you. And you're not, it's, you're not concerned as to whether or not it's a 4% rule or three and a half percent rule because your retirement account is placed in a position to where you can do what you want to do. And then obviously there's the scale and it's, it's kind of what we discuss, but you hit on something very, very important. None of that matters if you aren't the best you. None of the, we, we can share with you the concepts. We can share with you the right vehicles. We can provide you with the right knowledge all day long. 
But that math will never math. Those results will never happen if you don't decide, if you don't decide that, you know what, this is a non-negotiable for me. These are the actions that I'm going to take. This is the direction that we are going. We're going this direction as a family because we're all in the same boat and this is where we're headed. So you know what? This year for Christmas, it's going to look a little bit different. Why? Because we have some objectives and some goals that we have to hit that are non-negotiable. So all we're doing is sharing with you the information. And again, we can we can we can provide you the information which allows you to uh, to achieve the right knowledge. We can share with you what these vehicles would be to be able to put your money in to be able to hit your goals. But that bottom part, the right you, that's on you. The right part on it's you deciding that this is a priority. It's powerful, super powerful on the real estate. Before you jump in to to yep. um, to talk about the skia I, yep. or the wealth equation, even. Um, I think knowing what your options, knowing your options matter so much because there are so many things out here. A lot of people will go real estate. Is that for me? I don't want to do deal with tenants, toilets, and trash. I don't want to deal with any of that. That I don't want to pick carpet. I don't want to rehab a place or flip or any of that. So real estate just isn't for me. What would you say to that? I agree. I don't want to participate in any of it either. But is there a way to not have to percent, uh, participate in the tennis toilets and trash, but still be able to grow your nest egg above and beyond whatever those uh, those averages are? Absolutely. There's a, there's a, there's re uh, uh, what is it Rias? Yeah, Rias. There's there's um, there's many different options. You can become a hard money lender. Again, it's about getting structured properly understanding what the opportunities are available, becoming self-directed, having more control over where you can place your funds to be able to do so. Because I agree, I don't want to participate in any of those either. But that doesn't mean they aren't, there aren't uh, viable vehicles for me to be able to build wealth. And then from a building wealth perspective, again, I just wanted to just reiterate, you can have the right knowledge, you can have the right vehicles, but it all depends on the right you and understanding if we're truly talking about building wealth, the key to building wealth is getting, making sure your money is outside of the market, meaning reducing risk. So when you're understanding how, when you're focused on how to build wealth and you're getting in the same boat to understand and make sure we're throwing in the same direction, it's, are you paying yourself first? And if you're paying yourself first, when are you doing it? It has to be right now. It's not tomorrow. It's not when I pay off this debt. It's not once my home is paid off. It's today. And where you put your money matters, meaning reducing risk, eliminating, if you can, eliminating the risk, or if not, nothing else, reducing the risk. And you put your money in a vehicle that is truly compounding for you, meaning your money is making money and the money that your money makes, makes its own money. And then the last one is, are you leveraging OPM? So in an annuity, how do you leverage OPM? You can't. But in real estate, how do you leverage OPM? You do it all day long. You, you're putting your money in a position to where you're not taking on all the risks. So you leverage someone else's uh, know-how, someone else's skill set, someone else, else's dollars and cents to be able to grow your money exponentially. And then within a SCIA, again, a secure compound interest account, a premium finance strategy, a properly designed cash value life insurance product, there is absolutely an opportunity to be able to leverage OPM leverage the life insurance company's money to be able to achieve your goal. And again, that's that that to me is how you accumulate that wealth, how you achieve that wealth. So getting back to this slide that I highlighted er earlier. So if you're 25 years old and if retirement age is 65, again, I am a fan of focusing on how to retire early. But the concept that we've been discussing is for a million dollar nest egg, what does it take for a 25 year old to achieve it? What does it take for a 35 year old to achieve it? So assuming million dollar is, the, is that goal and what is that minimum amount you need to be able to contribute into a secure compound interest account uh, to be able to achieve it, we wanted to just kind of talk through and highlight what those dollar amounts are. And so in order to do that, we wanted to slide over to the calculator to be able to just highlight, again, 25, 35, 45, 55, by age 65, what are those minimum amounts that you need to contribute? So you can either show the full board or you can show the uh, the calculator, either one. Mm -hmm. Okay, so from a 25-year-old perspective, oh yeah, and I'd already done this one. So uh, for a 25-year-old, what does that look like? So if you're 25 till age 65, how much uh, do you have to put away in order to achieve a million dollar nest egg? 
And so what I had already concluded was it was about $214 a month. So 25 years old, putting away $214 a month. But look at how long you're doing it. It's 45 years. So assuming you never make any more money, you never achieve anything greater than what your income is today. Are you able to put in that 214 uh, for that for the next 40 years? And if you're able to do that, you would put yourself in a position to where you've achieved a nest egg of somewhere around a million dollars. And in having that million dollars, what that translates to is approximately about 9% in income every year. Again, beating the 4% rule, somewhere around 94000 is what it's showing. But again, in a secure compound interest account, that uh, $214 bought you a certain amount of life insurance. But over time, that life insurance grew because the death benefit is based off the life insurance plus any cash value that's growing, which produces a nest egg for you or a legacy in death benefit of around $1.5 million. So again, that's age 25. So at age 25, we're talking $214 a month. What does that look like at age 35? Like how different is that? Well, at 35, if you were to use the same $214 a month, it equates to about $400,000 in, in, um, in cash value, about $400,000 in a full nest egg. So how do you get this dollar amount closer to that million dollars? Well, obviously it means because I'm 10 years older, I need to contribute a little bit more. And that math ends up being, I think it's somewhere around $500 a month. I want to say it's like five, four. Oh, I have it right. Yeah, five, there it is. Five. So in putting away around $541 a month, it equates to a million dollars. So a dollar amount being $541 a month, if I'm age 35 and the objective is to have a million dollar nest egg by uh, age 65, that's $500 a month equates to about $103,000 in income. But mathematically, it ends up being a, a nest egg of around a million dollars. How much income, I'm not income, how much life insurance was purchased given that $541. Notice the difference between a 25-year-old and a 35-year-old. In this case, we're purchasing about $233,000 in life insurance with a death benefit being somewhere around $1.9 million. So that's for a 35-year-old. What does this look like for a 45-year-old? Again, so 35 to 65, that's 30 years you're allowing your money to compound. Well, what if that was 20 years to allow your money to compound? And again, clearly it's going to be something greater than the 541. I think this one is somewhere around, yeah, 1600. So meaning I'm giving my money 20 years to compound, it's less time. And if I put away that $20,000 in order to achieve that nest egg of a million dollars, again, 20 years, nest egg of a million dollars, income of about 115000 tax-free for the rest of your life. Again, if you compare this to a traditional retirement account, you take that same $1,500 a month, it's the same $384,000 $384, over that 20-year period, whether it's in an IRA or 401k, Roth or traditional. But notice the dollar amounts are comparable inside both, but the difference is the impact of, of what a nest egg translates into inside of a secure compound interest account compared to a traditional retirement account. So again, at age 45, you'd be buying all, close to a half a million dollars in life insurance. And that nest egg ended up ending up being, or the cash value, I'm still saying it wrong, the death benefit around the age of 65 being closer to $2.9 million is what you would be uh, transitioning over to your legacy if something were to happen to you around that age. And then the last one being age 50. If our age 55. So if you're 55 years of age and you're starting a little bit late, what would it take for you to be able to achieve that nest egg of a million dollars by the age of 65? Again, you're giving your money only 10 years or a to, to be able to um, um, compound during this period of time. And so obviously this number is going to be quite drastic, meaning drastically different than a 45-year-old who's putting away uh, or allowing his money to compound for um, 20 years. And so in that dollar amount looks more like $6,500. I think it's $6,550 to be specific. $6,500 a, a month over the next 10 years. So again, six, at age starting at age 65 to just simply achieve the million-dollar nest egg, it takes about $6,550 every month 
for that 10 year period to be able to achieve that goal. If you did that inside of a traditional retirement account, we're talking about 1.4 million is what you would have. Notice the difference, $400,000 difference in the size of this nest egg. But again, in in relation to the 4% rule, that 1.4 million only equates to $56,000 in income compared to 110,000. Again, double the amount of income even though you have almost four or over $400,000 less in cash value producing double the amount of income. And again, as we talk, as we talk, as we talk about legacy, we're talking about leaving about $5.2 million to your beneficiaries if something were, were to happen to you as a result. And so more of the story, if um, you are looking for a vehicle like this, and if you want, sweetheart, you can slide over to, back to the uh, vibe board, uh, that math around what, what are those dollar amounts that you're needing to contribute on a monthly basis based off the ages uh, that we've referenced, it's more like, again, sweetheart, you slide over to the Bible. Yep, yep, got there it. There we go. It ends up being about, at age 25, it's about $214 a month. At age 35, it's about $541 a month. 45, about $1,600. And at 55, about $6,550 every month. Why do I share this? Because for those of you who may be in between either earlier in, in the middle or at the end of any of these age groups, it get, should give you an idea as to what it is you would need to do. So if you're in between that age 25 to 35, what is that dollar amount you would need to be able to put away to be able to hit your goal? Well, first we have to identify what is the goal and then use this as a reference to help you understand what are those um, uh, vehicles you need to put your money in to be able to achieve what that dollar amount looks like. And this is just one example inside of a secure compound interest account to be able to do so. Uh, again, it's not one size fits all. There are other factors involved here, but there's a piece that we have not acknowledged. So I, I just want to make sure we don't leave today without acknowledging this is a million dollars, not including inflation. This is not an inflation adjusted number. This is saying if I'm 25 years of age and I'm putting away 214,000, or if I'm in this case, um, 55 years of age, putting away 6550 for the next 30 years, this is not an inflation adjusted number. Right. So if I'm putting away this dollar amount and I've got a nest egg of a million dollars, what does this million dollars equate to in that 10 year period? Meaning, what do I actually need this nest egg to be in order to achieve this income? How does this income actually translate 10 years from now if it's inflation adjusted? So for that, we will want to come to here. And so if we're talking about a million dollars over a, let me change that to 10 year, over a 10 year period, again, yeah. I'm 55 years of age. I've been contributing this dollar amount for the next 10 years. What does that look like? So what that ultimately means is I would need $1.3 million to be able to achieve that same $100,000 a month income or $100,000 a year income that I'm looking to achieve in order to be able to maintain my lifestyle. I need closer to $1.3 million as a nest egg compared to the million dollars that it's showing. And I think that's the piece that, again, if, if we leave with nothing else, it's where do I fit? What, what are my non-negotiables? Where do I fit in this range? And as I identify what that dollar amount needs to be, I need to also take into consideration that whatever that time frame is in the future, I need to be able to account for inflation. And still, maybe this is not realistic. Maybe you don't hit this number. That's not the point. The point is you understand what that number needs to be. And at least you're focusing on the true goal, which is the 1.3 million. If you fall right. short and you end up hitting 1.1, at least you weren't thinking that the goal was a million and you fell short and it ended up being about 800,000. So the objective is just to identify what the opportunity is so that you can understand what, uh, what, what, what steps need to be taken in order to achieve that goal. And I really appreciate some of the comments because the conversations that are, that we see a lot of in our community is I'm. I feel like it's too late for me. So what can I do to leverage this um, opportunity? Obviously, this is the better way to go if I would have known about it a long time ago. Well, if anybody, everybody would have known about it a long time ago. I mean, we advanced things in medicine that people who were diagnosed with cancer 20 years ago, they didn't get to benefit from, right? So right. there's, there's 
a lot of, of the new strategies and will continue to evolve. I am sure of it. But I think that it's important to understand, even in a situation like this, how can somebody be able to take advantage of, of this, Donnell, if they don't qualify? Because this isn't a, all you got to do is, right? Right. right. This is you have to qualify for this. So uh, what are some ways, because we've gone over so many here on our channel, but yeah. somebody could be new today or somebody could have not have seen all of those. So what are some of those ways that we have creatively crafted for people who wouldn't qualify on their own? Well, before I kind of dig into that, let me also just kind of say this. This is not meant to be a one size fits all. For instance, maybe you're that 25 year old that just graduated from college uh, you know, it, it's it's winter. It's you, during winter commencement. You just graduated from college. You're about to uh, start your new job at whatever thousand dollars a year, and you're excited because you you're now leaving campus and you're about to go buy your own place, be on your own, and be able to you know take care of yourself. Maybe it might. It maybe it might mathematically make sense for you based off the numbers that we've shown today. And instead of you going out on your own, maybe you have this conversation with your parents and you go, you know what? I think it mathematically makes more sense for me to stay right here in this household. And maybe we try to put move this boat together. And I take this opportunity to be able to build more wealth on my own while not having to qualify for rent or pay someone else's retirement because I'm paying this silly amount of rent uh, to this individual. I'm actually going to live at home and we figure out how to mathematically make this make sense for me. And in addition to that, what is what is another way? Well, if we're talking about a secure compound interest account, maybe the parents don't qualify. So maybe the parents who are 50 plus years of age and they realize they've only got a 10 year time horizon, right. maybe there's an opportunity to now leverage that that child of theirs who has just graduated college and is starting a new job and has decent income. And so they're at home saving money, being able to put themselves in a position to be able to build wealth in their nest egg. Well, there may be an opportunity for you to do use what's called insurable interest and leverage them to be able to start an, a secure compound interest account on that 25 year old and Maybe you can't own it as a parent, but maybe you can fund it as a parent and you guys work out what that math looks like around how do you help the 25 year old get to a point where they can retire, not at 65, but maybe at 45. But in addition, at year 10, when you start needing that income, that income is yours that you're able to leverage in this vehicle. So I said a lot to specifically ask, answer your question. It is you have insurable interest. So is there a way to be able to leverage um, some of the people that you have in your household, whether it's kids and or grandkids, to be able to um, uh, leverage their health and their ability to qualify for a vehicle like this so that you can build that family bank, that family wealth to be able to leverage and produce income? Um, real quick, Ida had asked uh, two questions that I thought were, was really important. I had been holding yes. them, but I, I feel like I... I held them for too long. So I hope, that, I hope there's, I saw them. So, so give them to me. It's, um, can this compound, uh, account be started with a single 10 K once a year deposit? Mm -hmm. so short answer to that. Short, short answer to that question is yes. Now, um, so if it's, uh, let's go back to a, a middle age, let's call it 35 years of age. And the question was, can I start a secure right. compound interest account? That's middle age? No, no, no. I'm just saying middle of the road. I did 25, 35, 45, and 55, right? I'm just saying it's either 35 or 45 would be that middle of the road age. Mm -hmm. I'm just talking where on the spectrum. Don't, I understand I understand you're old and I've accepted the fact that I'm old. And yes, I'm calling 35 in this example, middle of the road. So let's say you're 35 years of age. Come come save him because Whatever. I'm not I'm not old. I'm young at heart. Can I well, be old I didn't say you behave as though you're old. Yeah. I didn't say that. Yeah. But the number on the, you know, exactly. the birthday says something different. I'm just saying. AJ, nothing but a number. So your attitude's more important. Well, you wear it well, sweetheart. Yeah, thank, thank. I don't you. think there's anyone yeah, on this live that looks their age, just so we're clear. Yeah, probably. Yeah. No, well done. Saying. Well done. Um, we, so we, we do. We do have a 
we do have a beautiful audience, I will say. I'm just saying. Uh, so 35 years of age, can you put away $10,000 one time? Now, is that $10,000 one time only or is that $10,000 annually? I don't fully understand what that means, but I'm going to assume it's $10,000 on an annual basis. Can you put that, take that dollar amount and will it? what would what, what that do for you over time? Now, this calculator is a little bit limiting. So if you're putting in $10,000 annually, meaning one time annually, yes, you can do that, but I have to structure it as though it's $833 a month. But can you put in the $10,000 one time? Yes, you can. And if you were to put away $10,000 a month uh, annually, over time, it would translate into something positive for you, which would be about $160,000 tax-free for the rest of your life, nest egg of about $1.5 million. Again, I don't have the context of, of what um, what she was referencing. So if it, if that's $10,000 annually, yes, you have. There's, there's a few different ways you can contribute to a vehicle like this. It's monthly, quarterly, um, every six months, so semi-annually or is that bi-annually? I don't know which one that is. But anyway, uh, bi-annually and then annually is how you're able to contribute into a vehicle like this. So can you do $10,000 a year? Yes, you can. Okay, great. Next question is, got married for married couples, should each spouse open an account? Um, uh, it, it's not one size fits all. So can each spouse open an account? Yes. Does each spouse have to open an account? Not necessarily. Um, it can be on one individual. Because here's the top, here's the key piece to remember. You're buying life insurance. This vehicle is a purchase of life insurance. So if you have $20,000 available as a married couple, can you do $20,000 on one spouse and start your secure compound interest account? Yes. Or can you split that $10,000 between each spouse and start your secure compound, compound interest account? The answer is yes. And mathematically, if both spouses are of the same age, both spouses are of the same health, and you allow that dollar amount to compound for the same time, mathematically, it should all translate the same. So here's what I mean. If you've got a 35-year-old husband putting away $10,000 a year, mm -hmm. and you've got a 35-year-old wife putting away $10,000 a year, Regardless, if you allow those dollar amounts to compound to, let's say, age 55, let's bring it down some 20 years, that's sixty one thousand dollars that's available. That's sixty thousand dollars, sixty one thousand dollars each, which means it ends up being about one hundred and twenty thousand dollars tax free that the couple is able to take. Well, so it, don't ahead. forget that there's a death benefit. So if it's something were to happen to one of them, they're that's both it. covered. That's it. So the death benefit, again, this is assuming $10,000 for each spouse. So it would be about 1.9 million. And again, this number will vary based off health. This number will vary based off underwriting. So, but assuming same age, assuming similar health, preferred plus non-tobacco, uh, what we're talking about is about a $2, two million nest egg or $2, $2 million, I keep saying nest egg, $2 million death benefit times two. So on each individual. So, yeah. Yep. Okay. We have one more um, question here from Laura. She says, interesting. How can, interesting question. How can one take advantage of the REITs, storage, and best annuity? Thanks. REITs, storage, and best annuity. The only way you would be able to take advantage of those if we're talking about using qualified money, my assumption is you're, you're saying using qualified money. The only way you can take advantage of all three of those is to simply get self-directed. And that means take control over your previous employer's plans to be able to invest in what you want. And if you don't have a previous employer's plan, it's asking your current employer, can you do what's called an in-service transfer? And then what you would be able to do is take that lump sum of money. I'll make up a number. Let's call it $100,000. Take that $100,000 from your previous employer's plan get properly structured with a self-directed 401k, move that $100,000 into that self-directed 401k. Now, because you have full access, full control over those over that dollar amount, because you're self-directed, you're able to take a portion, let's say take 50,000 of it and put it into an annuity, an index-based annuity that is now building you income over the next 20 years that's going to produce uh, income for you for life. And then take that remaining $50,000, take 25 of it, and you can put it into a REIT. And take that remaining 25000 and put it into a self-storage opportunity as a hard money lender. Or if you're looking to purchase your own facility, you can do that as well. But the bottom line is you don't have control over any of those dollars unless you 
properly have a properly structured account to be able to do so. So yes, you can absolutely do it, but it all starts with getting self-directed. Okay. How to invest for yourself has a question. Would I be able to open a policy on my parents? Short answer is yes. Um, there has to be insurable interest. So there are situations where you may have insurable interest over your parents. Maybe they live with you. And so therefore they are somewhat of a dependent, but there also has to be, are they insurable? Meaning, are they young enough to where it makes sense for you to be able to do a policy on your parents? But the short answer to the question is, is it, is it possible? Are you capable? Are you able to do so? The answer is yes. Okay. And Jeff has a great question. How long can you draw money from a skia when you retire? Do you want me to move back over to the calculator? No, because the short answer to that question is for life. Um, the, the, the whole point and purpose of a vehicle like this is to produce income for the rest of your life. Now, the question is, how much of that income can you have for the rest of your life? Well, this calculator assumes that you're going to take whatever that distribution amount forever. But here's my argument. And I have yet to see anyone else make this argument. Matter of fact, for that, for the way to make this argument, go ahead and slide over to the calculator and, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Here in my head is if I had to listen to it the first time, we'd already be here. That's what I hear in my head. So, okay. anyway, um, so you're welcome. Uh, um, <laughs> you're 35 years of age and you're putting away $833 a month, which is $10,000 a year into a secure compound interest account. And now at age 55, you have available to you $61,000 tax free for the rest of your life. That sounds wonderful. Well, let's do some simple math. If you were to take this $61,000 and put it into your checking account, you now are able to take this $61,000 in perpetuity forever, as long as you live tax-free. Well, $61,000, once you put it into your checking account, how much did it cost you to actually fund this policy? It cost you $833 a month. Well, $833 a month is $10,000 a year. When I take this $61,000 in income, isn't there $10,000 in this number? Meaning if I put this in my checking account, couldn't I take $10,000 out of this number and put it here? Meaning I take the 61,000, which means now it turns into 51,000 as income for me. And then I take that remaining 10 and put it here. What did I just do? Well, I just funded this policy from and, and not just until age 55, but I just funded it till age 56. And when I do that, that means now the income that I have available to me just went up. And so if I take another 10,000 out of this 68,000 and put it here, which means I'm using this vehicle to pay my premiums, meaning I never stop making premium payments. I continue making premium payments either from here or from the cash value. It doesn't really matter where, when I win or where I take those make those contributions. But what I'm saying is you no longer are making them. You're allowing the vehicle itself to make the contributions into this vehicle, which means now it doesn't matter what your age is because as you get older, this dollar amount continues to, to increase. So if you continue making the $10,000 a year contributions till age, let's call it 60. What does that look like? How about $101,000 tax-free for life? But if I make continue making that $10,000 contribution, then by age 65, what does it look like? So my point is there's an opportunity for the income that you're taking continue to increase again forever. Now, at some point, you're going to hit a brick wall, meaning at some point you're going to hit what's called max insurability. At some point, the life insurance company is going to say, we can't give you any more life insurance. You have exceeded the maximum amount of life insurance that you're able to receive. To me, that's a good problem to have. Because what that says is your, your policy is max funded. There are no more exams that are, would be required for you to have to take. And this is the maximum amount of money that you can get into this policy. So now it's just growing for you over time. It's just compounding. It's just your money making money. And all you're doing is sitting back and watching that income be produced. And any additional leverage inside your policy, maybe you can't get it inside of this vehicle, but that's where you're now allowed or you would be in a position to max fund other vehicles like a policy for your spouse or policy for your kids or policies for your grandchildren. And then if you roll all of those policies into a trust, now you've created a vehicle that its only job is to buy policies as people are born. And that's at age 14 days. 
And as people pass away, the death benefit rolls back into the trust. So it becomes this vehicle that just produces income for you for the next 500 years. Damn, son, where'd you find this? This is pretty awesome. Even Nathan says this. That is the best way I have ever seen to stay ahead of inflation and retirement. That's it. Man, that's it. Yeah. Okay. Carlos says, how many loans can you take out in a given year? So there is a maximum amount of leverage that you have inside of your policy. So something to think about this income that's being referenced here, this income can be distributed as a monthly amount. It can be distributed as an annual amount, but the total, the 159,000, what we're saying is this is the total annually that you're able to take. So how would you take that distribution? And what does, do I mean when I say distribution? Again, this 159,000 is a distribution from this 1.5 million. What do I mean? Well, distribution is just a fancy word for saying borrow. So what's happening is you're borrowing this $159,000 annually from your cash value. How are you able to do that? Well, it's because your cash value is making, um, let's call it 12, 13, 14, 15%. So your cash value, this dollar amount is making 12, 13%, but this 159 is right around 10%. So if I'm taking 10% as a distribution, but my cash value is making 12, 13, I'm living off the interest. There's a spread created. That means this number continues to get larger, even though I'm taking this dollar amount again forever and I'm never running out of money. Well, so how many times can you leverage from this account? Well, if I'm taking a monthly income, 159,000, 160,000 divided by 12 is what? Well, maybe I need to take those do that dollar amount, whatever 160 divided by 12 is every month to be able to achieve that income. So how many um, loans can you, how many, how much leverage can you take out of your policy? I don't know that there's a limit. I think the limit is on the total dollar amount. But if you wanted to spread those, uh, those loans or that borrowed amount, you know, if you wanted to take $500 a week, $500 a day, and you wanted to borrow $500 a day from your policy, there's nothing preventing you from being able to do that. So I don't know that there is a limit on the number of, of loans that you can take. I think the limit is on the dollar amount that you're able to take over time. Because what you also don't want to do is cause your policy to implode. So if you've got $1.5 million in cash value, can you borrow $1.5 million? You can probably get somewhere close to that number, but should you? Like, does that mathematically make sense? Again, this is a vehicle designed for income. One, you're going to get a fair amount of pushback from me in doing so. But the truth is, this is your policy and you can do whatever you want to with it. Uh, but so, so, I, so to sum up the answer to this question, how many can you take? I don't know that there's a limit. I think the limit is more based on the dollar amount than it is the number of loans that you take out of the policy. Okay, I have a question. Um, okay. Because when, when you say that, I know technically you can't force somebody to make certain decisions inside of their policy or as with, with whatever their strategy is or yeah. is not, you can't force somebody out uh, or give them the financial financial advice, right? You can educate them on what their options are. They can make their, their own decision, right? That's what we do here. So I, but, but when you say that though, I don't know where the line is. And so that's why I'm asking this question. Okay. When and you, so, well, we'll hold on, let me finish my, yeah, cause it's ahead. like, I, there's layers here. Okay. When you say that I'm curious because how, like when you, it's coming, it's coming together guys. When you say that there's missing information that I hope, I wish that you would say, are you not allowed to say those things? Like for instance, some people ask this question because whole life agents touting, you can have access to your funds from day one. It's all yours. You're, you could take as much as you want. It's all there. You can do it. Don't you love that? And people are like, well, yeah, I love that. Matter of fact, Donnell said he doesn't, he would not do that, but I might need my money. So just in case that sounds like a better option for me, but you don't say that when you say, I wouldn't advise that, or I wouldn't do that. Why? So it goes back to what's the goal. Um, if the goal is to produce income, then what we want to do is structure this vehicle so that it produces the maximum amount of income. 
when you said the goal was income, you didn't say I wanted full access to all of my cash value on day one. You didn't say I want to borrow 90% of ca the cash value I have to go do infinite banking. You didn't say that. You said the objective, the goal is income. If you said the goal is I want on day one, I want to be able to leverage as much as I can, then okay, I can structure this policy to do so. But what I'm in structuring the policy to be able to do infinite banking, I am not structuring the policy to be able to produce the max amount of income, meaning I, I can't do both at the same time. Now, I can kind of do both at the same time, meaning if the objective is to do infinite banking, can you structure a secure compound interest account so that you can leverage the cash value to be able to do infinite banking? Short answer is yes. But how much of that cash value is available on day one? Well, it's actually more like day 45. People say day one, but it's really, you have to give some time for your money to get into the account and and and, and get fully accounted for and your and policy to fees. go in force. Right. And, and so, exactly. And so that math is somewhere around 45 days. So okay. in 45 days, if I'm putting in some lump sum of $100,000, how much of that lump sum is available to me in a secure compound interest account? It's somewhere between 40 and 60%. So if I put in 100,000 and my expectation is I have 100,000 available in 45 days to go do infinite banking, it's not happening in a vehicle like this. Why? Because this vehicle is designed for income. So how do you get beyond um, what is impacting your ability to be able to take the $400,000 at day 45? It is absolutely the structure of the vehicle. And that structure involves surrender charge. You have to get beyond the surrender charge. So a surrender charge isn't a dollar amount that comes out of your policy. It isn't a dollar amount that you've paid for. What the life insurance is doing is they're, they're hedging their bets on you. They're saying, wait a minute, before you access all hundred thousand dollars, we just need to make sure you're in this for the long haul. So they are, they are that surrender charge is a what if charge. So you have to get beyond that. Well, in year two, what was 40 to 60 percent now looks more like 80 to 88 percent. So you've got that 100,000 in year one. At year two, you have just about 80 to 88% of the full dollar amount accessible to you. Then at year three, when the leverage kicks in, when the relock feature kicks in, you now have 100 to more than 100% of all the money you've put in in year three. So if we just allow this dollar amount to compound for the next three years, you have full access to your money versus other cash value life insurance policies like whole life in year one, you might have 90% available to you. But when do you break even in your account? If it's structured that way, nine times out of 10, you don't break even till year 12, which means you will never have access to 100% of your money before somewhere around year 10, 11, or 12. Which one is better? Which one is more efficient? Which one allows you to build more income? In order to understand income, you have to go backwards. If it takes me 12 years just to break even in my account, what that means is my compound cycles are so long that in order for me to be able to achieve enough money inside this account to be able to produce income out of it, it's going to take a long time, if not ever. Versus if my account breaks even at year three, that means my compound cycles are a lot shorter, which means if the goal is income, if the goal is to be able to produce tax-free income, the amount of time it takes for my money to double is more like five, six years. And so therefore, it's easier for me to get to a point where 12, 15, 17, 20 years, I'm able to actually produce income that I can actually live off because it took less time for my money to double. Man, I'm answering a lot of stuff you didn't ask. But bottom line is, that's why this is not a one-size-fits-all. The reason why for you may be the uh, different reason why for April or different reason why for Nathan. It kind of really depends. Yeah. And it all starts go it starts with what is the goal? Okay, how to invest has a really good question. Mm -hmm. But I, I want to finish this part because what you didn't say was what I always think of when I ask the question, why? Why would somebody think that it's better to do this and have the access to their funds, right? Why mm -hmm. it, Why would this be better at all? Because I have this answer in my head and I don't know if you're allowed to say it. I don't know. So I'm just going to ask you. I probably could ask you off the stream, but I see no problem here Let's do it. asking you. Why isn't the answer because you it, the cost to borrow is more. So if you have access to your funds on day one and you start borrowing the, out of the policy on day one, you're now, 
it's now costing you versus you're not making any money because now you owe. You're starting off in debt in your policy. So how does it ever grow? How do you ever even hit the 10-year mark or seven-year mark? At best, I've heard some people say that they've they've reached seven or eight years, right? They can structure it differently, whatever is said. But if you are using it for infinite banking, you are putting that that uh, year out. You're that's year 12, year 15, depending on how far in the hole you're you're digging yourself by borrowing from this policy, because most of these policies grow at an average of 4%, right? Guaranteed. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. But the cost to borrow is 5 Higher to 8%. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, and so it's just math. If I am... Um, if my, and again, this is the part that, that, that st I struggle with when people say, be your own bank, Yeah, name right. the bank that yes. would be okay with this formula. Name that one part. bank yes. that would be okay with this formula. The money that I'm making is 4% guaranteed. The fact that it's guaranteed growth is awesome. So 4% guaranteed is it's what's going on. It says the live broadcast is ends in four seconds. What am I? I don't you see know. that? Yeah. That's weird. It didn't end. So, okay. Sorry. Distracted. Squirrel. All right. So tell me the bank that would be okay with this. Your money's growing at 4%. Hmm. When you go to leverage, when you go to use that money, meaning I'm going to use that money to go pay a bill, buy a car, do infinite banking, bank on myself, whatever the case may be. So the money's making me 4%. I'm going to borrow that money at 5 to 8%. Let's go in the middle. Let's call yeah. it 6 so I'm making four. It costs me six to borrow. So the minute I take my money out of my policy, I'm losing 2%. Yeah. And then I'm going to go do infinite banking and hopefully make more than that, which is why people who offer infinite banking policies say, if you're going to be your bank, you have to treat yourself like a bank and pay yourself back the interest. But I, st I go back to the original question. What bank would be okay with lending out money for more, I mean, lending out, making less on the money that they're lending out. There's no arbitrage. It's negative arbitrage. What bank is okay with the creating a negative arbitrage operation? They would not be in business if the money that they were lending to you, they were making negative arbitrage on. It just would not happen. Yeah. And that's the part where you're not banking on yourself. What you're doing is you're borrowing money at a higher interest rate and you're going to do an opportunity that hopefully makes you more so that you can pay back what you have. But what ends up happening is people's policies end up imploding because they don't they don't fulfill that obligation of paying their uh, paying themselves back the more than the interest that they uh, they were that they were achieving inside the policy to put it back at whole. Versus in a vehicle like this, that it costs you 4% to leverage your money. Your money is making 7% on average. Sometimes it's more, sometimes it's a little bit less, but on average, it's more than the cost to borrow, which means the minute I access my funds inside this vehicle, I am making money. It's positive arbitrage. And then I take that money out and I do something special with it that hopefully makes me more money. So now because I'm making more money than even the money that I was already making inside my policy and then I pay that back, that means my 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 account is growing in three different places. Yeah. It's growing inside the product, meaning it's making 7% on average, then I leverage the money, I'm making 3% on the money that I've leveraged and I'm doing infinite banking that allows me to now uh take take advantage of an opportunity that's making me even more arbitrage. I'm making arbitrage in three places versus that Sounds like a bank. That sounds like a bank versus what's happening inside of other products is I'm losing money inside of the product, but I'm doing infinite banking to go make, make money outside of it. Again, make it make sense. Yeah. Okay. Here we got some other questions. So what happens to the interest? Does it not compound every month as you keep taking loans? So there are two types of loans. There's a fixed uh, loan and there's a participating loan. Now, the type of loan, you again, that's where structure matters. And so the interest that, that's happening inside of your policy is simple interest. And does that simple interest compound? Meaning uh, there's two ways of looking at compound interest, meaning the 4% that I owe on this loan, does it is it now getting larger? Is that interest amount getting larger? Well, it's getting larger because I if I don't pay it back, that 4% is continuing to grow. So it's additive not necessarily compounding, it's additive. 
And so, yes, the the dollar amount that I owe from year to year does get larger because if I don't pay it back, there's an additional 4% on the new dollar amount. Uh, but what is growing inside your policy? Is the money growing inside your policy also compounding is the question. And so the question is, which one is it mathematically allowing you to still make more money outside of the policy or inside of the policy compared to what that interest is bringing you? And that's if you're using that money outside of your policy to do infinite banking. If you're referencing the um, cost of the leverage, meaning the relock feature is also leverage happening inside the policy. A lot of people get, in, get confused on that one as well. Is that interest being compounded when the market crashes? And the truth beyond that is it's also additive, meaning the interest that's owed on the relock feature or the interest that's owed on the money being leveraged inside your policies purely for that um, the, um, uh, the relock or the match or the participating loan, whichever one you, whichever one you want to call it, because it's being added to your policy in the form of added premium, you don't owe principal and interest. You only owe interest. And because of the growth inside the policy is happening on average 7%, there's positive arbitrage happening on the growth of that dollar amount. So you don't even owe interest on the money that, that you just pulled in as brand new principal because the growth inside the policy pays for that interest. But now when the market crashes, not if the market crashes, but when the, when the market crashes, what happens? Well, that 4% that's owed is accounted for. But is it a compounding 4%? Meaning, does that 4% cause that dollar amount continue to exponentially get bigger? And the answer is no. Because you would owe interest in the year that the market crashed. But when the market recovers the following year, or if you had uh, two consecutive years of, of, of negative performance, it's an additive issue. It's not a compounding issue, meaning you owe the interest on the dollar amount owed every year the market crashes and the total of that interest is added together. But it's not a compounding issue, meaning it's not all of a sudden exponentially getting bigger. And again, a lot of words. I think the easiest thing to do is to see that visually. It would just take too much for me to kind of show that to you. And it's something that we've covered on many, many lives. And I, I know it's something that we'll continue to cover throughout. It's just for me to visually show that to you, it, it would take take a little bit more. Yeah, we can we can put that in the queue, though. I think that's yeah. a great thing. He has um, he has another question but I'm trying to clarify what he means. So we're going to move to April's question real quick. If, if one goal is to access a million yearly from your skia, what would your original amount have to be? Ballpark figure is fine. Okay. So if you wanted to do a million dollars, a million dollars in annual income, or do I have a million dollars in cash value and I'm taking income from that million dollars in cash value? Because if it's a million dollars in cash value and I'm taking income on an annual basis from that million dollars in cash value, that is the 25, 35. That's what we've just done. But if you're talking about what would it take for me to be able to achieve a million dollars in income annually, it's a significant dollar amount. And if it's about, it depends on the age. Uh, but if we were just to use that again, the 35 year old, if it takes see, what was that dollar amount? If it takes $541 a month to achieve a million dollar nest egg, which is about $100,000 a year, we ultimately have to multiply that by 10 to be able to, to achieve, no, not by 10. That's a hundred, yeah, 100,000, 10, 100,000 is a million. Yeah. So you would have to ultimately uh, multiply that number by 10 for a 35 year old. So if it's $541 a month to achieve $100,000 a year, my math says it would end up being somewhere around $5,400 a month for you to be able to achieve a million dollars in income by that same time frame. So I would say if you would multiply all of these numbers that we had talked about earlier by 10 on a monthly basis, that should be, uh, should be what allows you to achieve that million dollars in income on an annual basis. You said ballpark it. There's your ballpark. Yep. Okay. I think, um, I think the better thing to do is how to invest is saying he'll text in because I think his question needs to be, he needs to be a caller. So what's the question? I still want to know. And I'm on a, I'm hanging on the edge of my seat. Okay. It's, um, it's about MPI multiple stop being, when does the MPI multiple stop being added to the policy? And I just when think does, best if he calls in. When does the MPI yep. stop? No, here, we're calling him right now. That's what we're doing. 
two seconds, guys. We're going to, we're moving into the future with the tech. Okay, hold on. Here we go. Oh. Thanks for calling. To connect and talk, just say your name and what you're calling about after the beep. Get self-directed. <laughs> hey, it's us. Hey, thanks. Okay. <laughs> what did we just talk to? The future. Hello. Hello. Are you there? Can you hear me now? Oh, I bet he's muted. Unmute yourself on the on the phone because then we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Hello, hello. So again, while we're waiting on that, complete uh, answer the question again. Ask the question again. Oh, maybe maybe I need to call back. Maybe it didn't work. The question is, when does the multiple the MP here? I'll put it up. Oh, thank you. I think, maybe I can. Yeah, I think it. what he meant. When does MPI multiple stop being added to the policy? And I think there's a few different ways to to kind of interpret this. When does the MPI multiple stop being added? What I think he's asking is when does the leverage, the relock feature, stop being added inside the policy? And the thing about leverage is. There is no limit to the amount of leverage that you'd be able to add into this policy. I don't think that's what he means. So hold on. But hold on. There's many different things. So I'm, I'm going to try to kind of check all the boxes. Okay. Let's get him on the line while you're doing that though. Okay. So. Here, I'll, I'll mute it. Okay. Um, so again, when does the Hello? leverage stop? It doesn't. And you're not muted, by the way. Um, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on. I'm trying to get this going. So the leverage doesn't stop. What it in, impacts anything that's going to cease inside of this policy is really based off max insurability and uh, being max funded, meaning there's a certain amount of life insurance that we all qualify for. That life insurance is based off your income and your age and your health. And so there's a maximum amount of life insurance that we all qualify for across all platforms, meaning whether we're talking um, um, uh, permanent life insurance, term life insurance, it doesn't matter. Any info enforced life insurance that you have, there's, an, there's a maximum amount. And when you hit that wall, that doesn't mean the leverage inside your policy stops. That doesn't mean you aren't able to continue to grow and build the compound interest inside of that account. What that means is you just can't qualify for more death benefit. And so if you can't qualify for more death benefit, but your account, the leverage inside of your policy is still continuing to grow. What do you do with all of that extra leverage? Well, this is where you have to go put that leverage to work. This is where infinite banking does come into play. This is where maybe op using your insurable interest and opening up policies on your legacy or max funding policies on your legacy comes into play. Because if you're a grandparent, you can open up policies on your grandchildren and your the parents don't have to have policies on them. So if the parents don't have policies on your grandchildren, you are able to do so. Now, there's criteria that have to be met, but the moral of the story is it can be done. And so... Uh, that leverage continues to get bigger, even though you aren't able to qualify for more life insurance. So that that's one aspect of uh, when does it stop? I think the key is it the factors that stop MPI at all are is your policy max funded, meaning have you hit the maximum amount of life insurance you qualify for? And are you putting in the maximum amount of premium into that policy as a result? And max insurability. Have you exceeded or have you, have you maximized the amount of life insurance that you qualify for? Those are the only only things that actually stop or that would cause your policy to uh, that we, we have to adjust or stop or be able to do something different. So. Go ahead, sweetheart. Well, I don't think we're going to be able to do that. So we tried. We did. We tried. He has a. um Something's going on when I call him. And if he calls our number, it gets forwarded to your phone. So, yeah, because you're a scammer. Scammers aren't allowed to get in on his phone. That's I'm a scammer? You're a scammer. Oh, on the, mm -hmm. um, the way that it reads the number. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Gosh, I don't like that. I don't want to be a scammer. 
Mm-hmm. All right. Well, we'll we'll get more clarity on what he was um, talking about, and we've got some other comments here. So let's move forward, mm-hmm. and then maybe we can figure this out. Well, okay. and we're about two, uh, almost two and a half hours in, so I would suggest we, um, you know, it's time for me to eat. Yeah. I hope somebody's down there stirring the chili or we're going to have a burnt bottom on the chili. <laughs> Not the burnt bottom. No. Okay. I think the relock is oh, what they are referring to. Mm-hmm. When does the relock kick in January one or anniversary date? Anniversary date. So th- we all started our policies at different times. So you become eligible for the relock feature at the end of the second year at your anniversary date. And so, and, and during that time frame, you have a certain period of time that we have to also take advantage of the, um, the relock feature. So that's something that we've never really discussed. So not only does it start, and so it starts right at the start of your third year. So right as your second year is ending, uh, the, the window for the relock feature kicks in, meaning we have to take advantage of that opportunity because in some cases you might have to qualify for more life insurance to be able to put more premium in. But also in some cases you may have the room already available. So we're just going to re- use that relock to be able to fill that room. So, yeah, well, it wouldn't be, uh, wouldn't be worth it if we didn't give away some boats. And so I think, I think we have the opportunity to do that. So it's been a minute since we've been over here. I feel like, I feel like you get out of, out of, um, out of practice habit. Yeah. Practice. Yeah. That's what I mean. I mean, something, Jeez, something meaningful. Come on y'all. All All right. Let's refresh here because I think we have more people in the chat. Yep, we did. All right. So wait, wait. Oh, look at my music. All right. Let's see here. Who's going to win a boat? I think most people watching know know what the boats are. <gasps> Ida! Well done. Well done. Yeah. Right on. So Ida, and I'm going to assume that that may be your full name, but all you have to do is text us your full name and the handle that you use during this live in case Ida is not your, uh, is not your, not, not, not your actual name. Text us your full name, uh, the handle that you use during this live and your address, and we will send the boat to you. Yep. And I was looking at, but I think we've, we've changed all of them. So we don't want to get questions. Yep. So this is the the phone number is the same. So if you text this phone number, text my uh, text text your uh, full name, your handle, and your your home address to the number below. Um, we will get things started for you. Yep. Okay. Text in your name and handle. Two. We just needed one of these. There mm-hmm. it is. Okay. Now we have one. Okay. Let's roll again. Because I, I love that. Let's see who else we got. I'm guessing Nathan. Nathan, man, if you have not, <laughs> if you have not bought a lottery ticket, <laughs> you need to go buy Called one it. because you. Your name gets picked on here so many times. We also need to find a new spender, but I haven't yet. That um, is easy to do. So, and I see it more as it's it's the algorithm of who participates the most in the chat, and oh, Nathan is maybe. always participating the most in the chat. So the math says it's going to be Nathan a lot. He gets more more That's it. more slots with That's the it. with That's the it. wheel. Hmm. Okay, it's the algorithm. Well, well, let's spin again, and if it doesn't, then we'll just we'll we'll pick Ida. Mm-hmm. She gets one anyway. Veronica! You know, Veronica already got a boat too. So, all right. Well, there it is. And we have... Ida it is. We, 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 we're going to give back. You know what I wanted to do this time? How about we do this? Instead of uh, doing the wheel, if you put in the chat... If you're here, because it picks it out of the chat, by the way. So if you're watching and you're not in the chat, that's how you win the boat. If 
You are, and we're putting other things in the boat because we're going to start some some new things. In the, in the packaging package. for the boat? Yeah, the for the boat, yeah. yeah good. Um, because we're going to start some... We're going to start some new some new stuff at the top of the year. I feel like there's some other opportunities inside of our community to be able to um, to level up. And maybe there's some other tools other than just the boat, right, that could help us to do that. So, uh, But maybe what we do is we cheer for somebody. If you know that somebody is new here and you're in the chat, put their name, put their handle in the um down in the chat box. Yeah. And then we'll just kind of like vote for, for someone real quick. We'll see who gets more than one, one shout out. Okay. Veronica, you did win one. And I found out that somehow addresses or labels got crossed up and yours actually went to somebody else. So had to send you another boat. That's what so, I did. Boat is on the way, dear. Oh, so you already sent it. I was about to say, send us the information. So we can, so you've already sent it. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, ver- yeah, send send it again just to make sure. I'll verify that with you, and then uh, we'll, we'll send another one if that's what we need to do. Okay, do you have dates for your financial freedom tour? Yes, we do. We are getting those dates. I even printed out this calendar so that I could start marking when they were because uh, we're looking to fill it up, by the way. So and I'd probably so say as of right now, I've got about maybe five, if not somewhere between five and eight dates so far. Yes. And we will be in Indiana, San Diego, California. I think there's a couple in California. Um, Orlando. Florida, Orlando, and mm-hmm. here in Arizona. Mm-hmm. It'd be quite a few events in Arizona. And I would expect um, uh, a few Texas dates and a few DMV dates. So we're talking the uh, Virginia, Maryland, uh, DC area. Yeah. Each boat added helps make them go faster. Well, that's what I'm talking about, Nathan. Nathan's like, don't send me my boat. I won fair and square. Send it along. You've already got my address. Mm-hmm. We'll send it. Okay. Um, I don't think I, Hey Zaid, by the way, um, good evening. I would like to have a conversation. I've watched several videos, but need to get a better understanding of how and what strategy might work better for me and my wife, my wife to be. Congratulations. So, yeah, okay. Osmond, did you already put it up? Nope. Go ahead. I was just trying to make sure I didn't. Um... <laughs> Edward said, "I think you mentioned that she's a spammer." I'm not. It's not true. He was kidding. Look what you started. <sighs> All right. To the last person who we were just had up. Gosh, this is hard to go back and forth. I'm trying to find. Oh. Maybe this right here. I like it. Maybe that. Um, let me take the scammer off. Gosh. Maybe, okay, so to answer your question, Osman, you can text us at 602-750-7311. Sounds like that could be a jingle, right? It's coming. It's confusing you with the time, I bet. 777-9311. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it sounds jingle like a jingle. Or go yeah. to selfdirected.info yeah. and you can get the... The um, information there. But we have a lot of free resources that we like to share with everyone. If you're new here, be sure to like this stream somewhere down here and subscribe so that you'll get the note. Now, you won't get the notifications that we go live. And some people say, how do I know when you go live? If you look down below somewhere, if you're on the TV, because we know that about 50% of people watch us on TV, then you'll see subscribe and a bell. If you hit that bell, that's when you'll get notified. As soon as we go live, you'll get that notification. You can click on the notification and then you can join us from the top then. If you are just subscribing to us though, then it's kind of a roll of the dice if you're gonna be able to see that we're actually live. You'll have to like manually come in and check. Mm -hmm. So that's the difference there. Okay, so I love this. Look at Celeste in here. She's like a pro. Osman, 
What's the goal? Welcome. Where's your goals? Bring them on. Let's go. Love you guys, by the way. And it is pretty amazing to see that this is like becoming a language for, for a lot of people. Like the first question to ask is what's the goal? Then what? Right. And each one teach one. It's a proud moment right there. Okay. So on that note, we like to end with, if you didn't come from a wealthy family, you can make sure a wealthy family comes from you. I have to find the, 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 um, hold on. I wasn't ready. No. Okay. She wasn't take, ready. Take two. We like to end with, if you didn't come from a wealthy family, you can make sure a wealthy family comes from you. So stay focused, stay protected, stay tuned, stay connected. My name's Angelique and I'm Donnell and we're here to help you get self-directed. That wasn't what we say. And our goal is to help you still get self-directed. Okay. And to do that, here are the free resources that we were telling you guys about. We have completely missed you guys too. And so if we just thank you guys so much for joining us this evening, please be sure to not only grab these free resources, but share them with someone else. Thanks for tuning in guys. We'll see you Sunday. Have a good evening. Hey, before you go, we want to remind you that becoming fully self-directed means gaining complete control over your wealth, time, and freedom. It's not just an idea. It's a framework, a mindset, and the power to make informed decisions to secure your future. Being here means you're taking those steps, and we want to thank you for allowing us to guide you. We believe that we grow farther and faster when we grow together. So tune in next time and tell a friend to tell a friend. We've helped thousands of people just like you start their journey to financial freedom. And if they can do it, you can too. And if you're ready to learn more, we got you. Get a head start by grabbing these two free books. But how do they get them, Donnell? Head over to my website where you'll have access to a few things. A ton of free resources, case studies, and over 100 five-star reviews from people just like you. And in 15 minutes, we can explore what's possible for you. So don't wait. Invest, Invest in what, what you want, want, when you want. But first, let us help you get, get self-directed. Self -directed.